Um, I'm Blonev Clark, um, uh, uh, Professor of uh, Corporate Law and Financial Services in Trinity College Dublin, and it's my absolute pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, I, I think the, the topic, capital markets, uh, ESG uh, finance, in this session is particularly relevant uh, this week. Um, we're seeing at, at COP27 the UN Secretary General warning us that humanity is on a highway to climate hell and that the fight of a livable planet will be won or lost in this decade. So very strong messaging, and it's absolutely clear that we need a strong, concerted and global effort to promote ESG uh, and environmentally friendly investment products. And that's going to require all regulators working together to, uh, amongst other things, align the disclosure uh, frameworks. And I, I think this morning, uh, the election results in the US uh, make it clear that that there will be an increased challenge to to actually agree ESG rules and some of the climate disclosures championed by the Democrats certainly are going to, to face uh, strong opposition this year. Um, we're also looking at figures from Bank of America suggesting mm -hmm. that uh, the investment has flowed into mm -hmm. ESG funds. Thing. And that's going to lead to, uh, to to real pressure on regulators all over the world to tighten standards. And I, I think, uh, as we're going to hear this more uh, this afternoon, the EU authorities have been leading no, the charge okay. in that yeah, regard. It's so the corporate sustainability reporting directive you will hear yeah, all yeah. about, um, and uh, it certainly mm -hmm. is going to impose uh, disclosures to improve sustainability reporting. And at the heart of that, of course, is mandatory European uh, suitability, uh, sustainability reporting it's standards. So You're also going to hear um, this afternoon uh, about leadership in the it's form of a sustainable finance disclosure regulation and the uh, various uh, forms of um, funds, Article 6, 8 and 9 funds under that. Um, and we're all aware that although there's been a, a huge progress in that regard, that there are implications like and, uh, and, um, um, that are going to lead to disclosure requirements uh, being difficult to comply with. Um, we're certainly hearing uh, from certain sectors uh, that the, the classification could be straying beyond its intended purpose and becoming some sort of a label. So I think these are really important issues that we need to, uh, to, to hear about. And I'm absolutely delighted that our speakers um, today are experts in the area. So we're going to start with Michaela Siri, just in a slight change to the format. Um, Michaela is a, a colleague on the EBI, as well as um, you know, professor in uh, the University of Genoa. And Michaela is going to speak first uh, on this matter. And part of the reason for that is that we're delighted to congratulate him, he and Professor Gargantina, who you'll hear from uh, in a later session, uh, are actually leaving temporarily to be awarded uh, the EMCI SEPS Prize uh, for a paper on sustainability ratings and benchmarks. So we're really lucky to, to have him speaking um, today. Um, following him, we will have uh, Professor Edgar Lowe from the Frankfurt uh, School of Finance and Management. Um, and uh, Professor uh, David Ramos Munez, um, uh, and uh, I will uh, introduce those a little bit more fully um, uh, after the break. But firstly, we're going to to go to uh, Michaela and invite him to make a, a presentation to us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you a lot, Blenaid, for uh, your kind introduction. It's uh, a real pleasure to to be with uh, you, all of you, uh, and. Uh, to share uh, some thoughts on uh, ESMA mandate on sustainable finance. Uh, if we browse uh, the presentation, uh, we should uh, pick up some uh, key points on ESMA role, on uh, its sustainable finance uh, roadmap for the uh, next five years. We then move to the key challenges identified by ESMA. And uh, in the last part, uh, we will uh, devote uh, time to the EU carbon market assessment. As a, an introduction, I may say that uh, 
the transition towards a greener and more uh, sustainable economy has become a priority for the European Union. And therefore, HESMA has made a tremendous effort and delivered excellent results to ensure that the financial markets promote this shift by integrating ESG factors across its core activities. HESMA work on sustainable finance assured determinant support to the Commission's initiatives. And the other side of this the coin is that the shift of investor preferences towards financial products, which incorporate ESG factors, and the increasing impact of such factors on the risk, returns, and value of investments, have implications for ESMA mission to enhance investor protection and to promote stable and orderly markets. This is the reason why in the broader review of the European supervisory authorities in 2019 revision of ESMA founding regulation uh, emerged the role in relation to sustainable finance by requiring ESMA to take into account sustainable business models and the integration of ESG factors into its work. So the financial markets are at the point of change and uh, sustainability factors are increasingly affecting the risk, returns and value of investment. This uh, changing environment has implication for ESMA mission to enhance investor protection and promote stable and orderly financial markets. To this end, in February 2020, HESMA adopted its first strategy on sustainable finance. This strategy sets out a key objective, which can be seen in this slide. After that, building on the 2020 strategy in February 2022, ESMA published its sustainable finance roadmap for the next five years. This roadmap will help coordinate, prioritize, and provide the sequence in which ESMA should respond to the supervisory needs emerging in the sustainable finance area. However, the combination of the copious legislative activity in quick succession and the strong investor demand for sustainable products impacting different sectors of ESMA mandate requires and has required a, reviewing, a review of different streams of work that are relevant for ESMA and reconnecting them to a, real, to a clear set of implementation priority. We can see in this uh, 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 slide the key challenges. It, we can observe a fast evolving regulatory framework. There are also, there are also in uh, different member states a diversity in the interpretation and application of sustainable finance legislation. And uh, moreover, there is a growing demand for ESG investments not matched by adequate transparency and comparability. So, uh, the uh, ESMA and NCA task is particularly, particularly huge. Uh, there is an increasing risk of misalignment between investor ESG preferences and products. Taking all the key challenges into consideration, the ESMA priorities have been set to put first the greenwashing uh, uh, and promoting transparency and uh, at the same time uh, to uh, leverage the NCAs and the ESMA capacity in uh, monitoring and assessing uh, ESG markets. These priorities are intertwined with each other in certain respect and uh, this uh, uh, is a, a more uh, uh, 
a, a more uh, difficult uh, difficult uh, uh, task to be uh, to be considered. Uh, as I just uh, said, the source of risk depends on the misalignment between demands for investments uh, that can make a sustainability impact and the available investing opportunities marketed as sustainable. As such, greenwashing typically gives rise to potential detriment to investors who are looking to allocate resources to sustainable investments. The key question is uh, before how greenwashing is a, if it is and if it is a different type of mis-selling. I do not have an answer. Probably we need more empirical research the, to, 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 to elaborate a, a, a theoretical analysis. And, and before it is important, the NCA and ESMA uh, work in this area in cooperation with the academia and the conference uh, and today conference could help in establishing such an environment of cooperation. Back to our to my presentation also uh, regulatory arbitrage can also be one phenomenon that leads to greenwashing because the diverging application of the rules uh, on what constitutes a green financial product across the union should be take uh, should be considered a further source of regulatory arbitrage depends on the lack of comparability uh, transparency when products with a similar or even same naming convention do not share the same underlying characteristics for example in asset management the unequal understanding of the type of products which are subject to Article 8 and Article 9 of the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation may lead fund managers to disclose inconsistently under these articles and effective uh, cause unintentional greenwashing in some cases. So the, the more general point uh, emerges as we consider the need of a definition of greenwashing. It is important for ESMA and the NCA to arrive to at a definition of the greenwashing phenomenon that can help drive the supervisory work in a coordinated and efficient manner across sector and across the EU. But and this definition should be based on clear use in a hopefully completed rule book. This, need, this needs to include identifying the key features of greenwashing practices, getting to a comprehensive definition of the phenomenon and identifying related examples. We need good practice and bad practice, relying on the existing literature I could mention the IOSCO consultation report on sustainability related practices, policy procedure and disclosure in asset management, just to, make, to, 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 to mention one. In a very general sense, the term greenwashing refers to market practices whereby the public discloses the sustainability profile of an issuer and the characteristics and or objectives of a financial instrument or a financial product and the related process do not properly reflect the underlying sustainability risks and impacts. In uh, taking uh, this perspective, we should also have a look at the tripartite approach of ESMA to a sustainable finance single rule book, if I may say so. We need uh, ensuring the consistent and effective application of EU Sustainable Finance Rulebook. We need also uh, to develop a common understanding of NCA's supervisory role in the area of sustainable finance in order also to, uh, to get clarity around the legal requirement that apply to market participants especially in this uh, uh, startup phase. 
it's not an easy task if we consider the inconsistencies and uh, uh, open question still surrounding the level two uh, regulate, uh, implementing measures in respect of uh, just to mention one, the taxonomy regulation and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. Uh, in the interest of time, we can uh, move to another relevant point in our analysis, which is related to the uh, use of uh, supervisory briefing. Uh, as, uh, as we know, uh, ESMA uh, recently published a briefing for national supervisors to drive convergence in the supervision of investment funds with sustainability features. The supervisory briefing is designed around a risk-based approach to supervision, meaning that the intensity and frequency of the sustainability-related supervision of investment funds are determined based on the assessment of the risk affecting these funds. The HESMA supervisory briefing intends to further enhance convergence among NCAs by addressing the potential issues arising from the supervision of sustainability-related disclosures, as well as the integration of sustainability risk by fund managers and the design of common supervisory practices. This common approach should serve to increase transparency for investors, as well as avoiding the practice of greenwashing. ESMA is of the view that there is a strong need to promote supervisory convergence, and we should agree, in order to minimize the risk of different uh, levels of investor protection among uh, member states, uh, or uh, depending on the, where the relevant fund is uh, domiciled or marketed, uh, if uh, on a cross-border basis. However, from a legal point of view, the supervisory briefing legal status is uh, still relevant. As we know, the supervisory briefing is issued under Article 29.2 of the ESMA regulation, which enables ESMA to develop new practical instruments and convergence tools such as supervisory briefings. The purpose of these tools is to promote common supervisory approaches and practice. The content of this supervisory briefing is not subject to any complaint or explain mechanism for national competent authorities and therefore is not binding. I may say it's a teamwork. So a fragmented approach to supervision and enforcement may remain with us for a long time if, if this tool will not be enough. And so this is a, a, a relevant point for our for our panel. Let's move to the final part of my presentation on, camp, on carbon markets. Uh, uh, as we know, voluntary carbon markets are uh, widely considered to have an important role to play in achieving greenhouse gas emission goals. Market demands uh, from entities and individuals purchasing uh, carbon credits that are created through investments uh, in nature-based or technology-based projects have fueled growth of the sector, with demand project to increase by a factor of 50% or, or more by 2020 and a factor of 100% by 2050. So high-quality voluntary carbon credits are essential to the future development of a voluntary carbon market. And in response to that, work is underway through the uh, Integrity Council at the international level for the voluntary carbon market, the, uh, with the cooperation of International Emission Trading Association and also ISDAS to establish global consistent standard and best practices of the generation of credits. At the global level of regulators arena, also IOSCO Wall Stream on carbon markets has commenced this year under the joint chairmanship of CFTC and ESMA. 
If you look uh, at the uh, regulatory oversight in the US, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, uh, the VCC derivatives are considered commodity derivatives. So the CFTC and the self-regulator organization could apply the same oversight tools by using commodity markets to ensure the integrity of the voluntary carbon credit. This includes conducting additional due diligence on carbon registries, given they are used as delivery points for VCC futures contracts. Also, the increased role of established exchanges in ensuring the integrity of the registries will likely increase the confidence in the VCC market. And this is important because uh, uh, this framework would translate into better and more reliable pricing for spot and the OTC derivatives markets. Uh, I have only to add a mention to the initiative undertaken by the CFTC Commission on June 2, 2022 that convened for the first time market participants to discuss the state and the challenges of the US voluntary carbon credit markets. Uh, at the end of the meeting, the CFTC published a request for information on climate related financial risk. Uh, and the reason why, of that is that the, the CFTC has only a limited enforcement jurisdiction over ESG commodities and the jurisdiction is triggered only when derivatives or commodity interests are involved. So uh, uh, the CFTC choose to hold the convening to address the increasing use of sustainability linked derivatives both in the OTC and the, in the regulated exchange markets but are being used by, bar by market participants to mitigate climate risk. And uh, the initiatives undertaken by CFTC are relevant also for the European uh, landscape. If, if you move at the European uh, carbon market, we can see also ESMA uh, uh, still is, is working to establish a set of good practices and essential features to, that support the sound, safe and transparent functioning of these markets. ESMA published an in-deep analysis on the functioning and surveillance of the EU carbon market in March of this year. And uh, the final report unveiled the important findings and policy recommendations, notably to further improve transparency and monitoring of the EU carbon market. However, it is a common understanding that uh, the recent developments in the carbon market, including the energy crisis, require additional analysis based on an updated market landscape. Uh, ESMA has considered the potential policy recommendation regarding the EU carbon market, obviously from the perspective of a securities supervisor. This policy recommendation include a proposal to provide trading values, uh, trading the derivatives on emission allowance uh, with additional monitoring tools uh, in order to deliver more, deliver more transparency to market participants and to the public. And uh, lastly, obviously, to expand the scope of regulatory reporting and enhance superior supervisory market surveillance. Um, remains, uh, in my view, two fundamental questions. Uh, ESMA has also looked at two other possible courses of actions on which it did not express policy recommendation. But uh, these two measures require further consideration. Uh, one is uh, the position limits on derivatives, on emission uh, allowances. And the second question is uh, the setting up of a centralized market monitoring of a EU carbon market. I skip the, the, the first one because uh, we don't have enough time, but uh, I would conclude uh, my presentation with some reflection on this uh, second uh, uh, item. Uh, if you look at the ESMA report, uh, 
uh, we we can uh, realize that uh, ESMA had to collect uh, data from a variety of sources and a more centralized approach to the monitoring of the carbon market uh, revealed the, the opportunity to provide also the benefit to, uh, to, to, to show the benefit of a potential centralization of monitoring at the EU level. Currently, no example exists in the EU of a financial instrument within the, the remit of ESMA being centrally monitored at a European level. Instead, European national legislation describes the competencies and powers of NCAs with regard to the monitoring and supervision of financial instruments being traded in their respective jurisdiction. So the fundamental question is if we need a centralized market monitoring of a EU carbon market and if it, this uh, centralized market monitoring is desirable. We have a at the EU level, an example of central monitoring, which is uh, uh, driven by uh, Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, the ASER. The EU Regulation on Energy Market Integrity and Transparency, the REMIT, established the basis of, for the monitoring of the wholesale energy markets at the European level. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, um, ASER uh, is uh, best placed to carry out market monitoring at EU level as it, is, it, it has a union-wide view of electricity and gas market. So uh, there are pro and cons in every regulatory and policy decision uh, in the sense of uh, of uh, establishing a centralized market monitoring, we can uh, assume that also the EU carbon market should be a very European one by nature. On the contrary, uh, it could be a major change to the current organization of market monitoring in the EU. And the uh, change in this uh, structure should be justified by an identified failure in the EU carbon market monitoring performed by national competent authorities. So, to conclude a final remark, a more in-deep analysis uh, also for, uh, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, point is required. Uh, if we will move towards a centralized market monitoring, probably ESMA would be in a better position to, to operate such a, such a task and uh, also an exchange of uh, information data with answer would be obviously necessary. And uh, this could be a test for, uh, for the futures of uh, also for the capital markets in Europe uh, and for, uh, for, uh, for ESMA as a, a European uh, European Supervisory Authority, uh, absolutely fundamental. Thanks for, uh, again for the invitation. Many thanks indeed, Michaela, for such a, a comprehensive and, and thorough and clear uh, presentation, looking at the challenges and the insights and also some of the initiatives um, and uh, also for identifying the, the need and the area in which further research will be useful. Um, I know you, you, you have somewhere to be and you've been extraordinarily generous with your time, so we're not going to detain you any further. We have no questions at the moment in the chat, so we will thank you uh, for, for participating and uh, wish you good luck with the presentation. So, thank you. Thank you a lot, Brenner. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we will now move on with the uh, second presentation. And so, just uh, to, to let you know, uh, we will take the second and third presentations together, and then there will be time at the end uh, of the two presentations for questions and answers. So if you have any questions for, for either of the next two presenters, uh, please use the, the, the chat function and uh, I will keep an eye on that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm delighted to be uh, turning over to, to my colleague, Professor Lowe, um, to uh, discuss in a little bit further detail uh, the idea of sustainability reporting standards. So the floor is yours.
So I hope that you can hear me and you can see the slides. Perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you for the invitation. And, um, and I'm really delighted to give a short presentation on the issuers uh, point of view a little bit, but also directing to the maybe auditors point of view a little bit. So I'm starting with an introduction and I'm going to present you some initiatives um, and then after presenting the initiatives um, and giving an overview over them, I would like to look more inside um, to some of them and I will close with final remarks or some questions that I raise. So the introduction is um, actually we do have um, this role of sustainability and the social and environment dimension being already implemented in the Treaty of the European Union and the Treaty of the Function of the um, European Union. Um, however, the problem that uh, arises here is that um, there are existing information asymmetries. So the investors cannot really inform themselves sufficiently about the sustainability of their investments. And therefore, it is really necessary um, to um, work on the disclosure um, parts. And we will see in a few minutes that there were many, many initiatives um, regarding disclosure. In this context, the concept of sustainability is represented by three um, subcategories. It is, on the one hand, corporate social responsibility. On the other hand, environmental, social and governance. And thirdly, sustainable finance. So a little bit about the terminology. Uh, the, um, uh, the economic responsibility is a cornerstone for sure, but there is some overlapping um, terminology. And coming from the green paper, uh, they say CSR, and they're using the expression of um, CSR, um, seeing that as a business concept, according to which, in addition to the goal of profit maximization, um, a positive contribution is made to society in the form of social and environmental concerns that go beyond the legal requirements. In contrast to CSR, ESG explicitly mentions also the governance um, component, which is really essential um, with um, what we will see later on. So sustainable finance describes then um, the process of considering ESG when making investment decisions. So we've, we've faced many, many different um, initiatives. The starting point probably was in March 2018 when it came to the action plan um, of financing sustainable growth that was developed in 2018, as I said, um, and, it, and it aims um, to redesign the financial system in a way that private capital um, can surely be redirected towards more sustainable investments. Um, but um, as a basis for doing so, um, it is necessary to, to have um, some more disclosures in, in order to inform oneself um, about the investments. And um, here, the action plan aims to be in line with the UN um, Agenda 2030 and the Paris Climate Agreement. So they, they are um, specifically um, defining three concrete goals redirecting capital flows into sustainable investments, inclusion of sustainability in risk management, and then transparency regarding um, these um, sustainability factors in disclosure. So the subsequent development, um, I'm starting with the EU Commission here, um, and we can see here from the EU Commission that they have um, proposed um, at least two regulations and two directives which are essential for the regulation of sustainability in the financial sector. Um, however, this is not really, sorry, this is not really the only one. It is also when it comes to the banking sector, the European Banking Authority working on that um, because they um, are empowered to issue some guidelines and recommendations for financial institutions. Um, and they did so, for sure. Um, the mandate um, to do so comes um, from CR2 and directive, um, the CR5 um, directive. Um, for, the, for that purpose, the um, European Banking Authority has created um, its own action plan on sustainable finance. And there they 
uh, include, for example, the guideline on lending, the standard on ESG risk disclosure, and the report on ESG risk management and supervision. We will come back to, to that also in a minute. Um, beside that, there is the EFRAC. The EFRAC um, is the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, which usually advises the European Commission when it comes to questions um, regarding uh, financial statements and uh, financial reporting. But they have um, given um, a specific mandate for ESG um, in order to develop new standards. And as we will see in a minute, um, they've done so. Um, they already developed quite many of them. They started in April 2022 uh, by publishing the first uh, drafts of European Sustainable Reporting Standards. And the final drafts should come out um, even now in, in a few days um, in November. Then there is on the international level, when it comes to reporting requirements, um, also the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation. And most of you are probably aware of the International Accounting Standards Boards because they deliver um, accounting standards and reporting standards. But in addition to them, um, there has been established the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB. Um, and that means that for those European companies that have to keep their accounts by um, companies um, that, which um, provide group financial statements, they have to fulfill the requirements of the um, international financial reporting standards. And in addition to that, um, also in the future, the standards developed by the International Sustainability, Sustainability Standards Board. Yeah, and uh, the ISB also has been active. They already published uh, two exposure drafts then uh, that are then in the future um, supplements to the IFRS. So then, um, as an overview here, you can you can see probably the EU standing here and um, all the different um, initiatives coming from the EU Commission here. Um, and I'm going through some of them in a minute. Um, the taxonomy regulation, the sustainability finance um, disclosure regulation, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, um, where the um, respective um, standards developed by the EFRAC are based on the corporate sustainability due diligence. And then when it comes to the banking part, specifically the European Banking Authority um, with their action plan and the respective guidelines and standards um, that have been developed. And in addition to all of that, when it comes to um, um, companies that are um, using um, the capital market in one or the other way. So capital market oriented um, companies, they have to fulfill the requirements of the International Sustainable um, Standards Board in the near future. So in order to bring that in a, in a certain order, um, I would say we, we on the left hand side, we are more in the financial sector itself. And whereas we are more in the real economy on the right hand side, although it is not a clear distinction, um, more or less, everything is based on the um, EU taxonomy, and I'm going to talk about that um, then. Um, then we have the SFRD, um, FSFDR, sorry, um, and the EBA um, ESG disclosure standard um, on the right hand side for the real economy, in addition also to banks, um, it will be the CSRD. Um, which will replace the non-financial reporting directive in the near future. Um, all of that is um, disclosure related. And then um, there is the aim to integrate all of that also in management decision. And um, that will be ruled from for banks, uh, partly, I would say, um, via the um, European Banking Authority. So a closer look in, in, inside into some of the um, these initiatives that I just mentioned and briefly touched upon. And the first one that I would like to talk about um, is the EU taxonomy regulation. Um, and the taxonomy is, as you could see, a, a kind of a basis for everything else because it really defines something 
um, what, what is sustainable, what is defined as sustainable. It addresses financial market participants um, offering financial products, as well as companies that are um, obliged to publish non-financial statements. Um, it um, defines an economic activity um, in the way that they say that it is an um, environmentally a sustainable um, activity, and um, it um, sh tries to, at the first step, to eliminate a little bit the asymmetry of information on the one hand between investors and financial market participants, but also um, on the other hand to make it um, more um, comparable the information by um, using several um, um, definitions. In addition to that, they require. Um, several disclosure regulations, um, and we will um, come to them um, very, very shortly. So when it comes to the, the um, taxonomy regulation, um, uh, outside the regulation, uh, um, the taxonomy regulation only has legal consequences through um, Article 8 in the form of disclosure obligations for companies in the real economy, um, which, which will be covered for banks um, by um, initiatives coming from the European Banking Authority. And I think the most prominent one and the most important one is the CSR directive, which, as I said, will replace the non-financial reporting directives. Um, and um, it is um, thereby extended in the taxonomy about the, the publication of taxonomy quotas. So the companies, um, corporates will have to disclose uh, specifically, um, but they are not limited to it, the percentage of ecologically uh, sustainable share of sales revenues, um, investments and operating expenses. So when it comes then to the um, sustainable financial disclosure regulation as such, I would like to um, turn your attention to um, the addressees and, and it addresses uh, financial market participants and financial advisors and obliges um, them to disclose information on sustainability risks um, on the one hand and adverse sustainability impacts in investment decisions and financial products. So they are sustainability risks refer to potential impairment of the value of the investment due to an environment um, social or governance event or condition, and also, this is the second, I would say, layer, um, adverse sustainability impact refers to damage to sustainable factors. Um, and uh, in, in brackets, you can see uh, some of the examples here. The disclosure takes place on, um, on the one hand, therefore, from a uh, so-called outside-in perspective, though the influence of external factors on the company, but also um, on an inside-out perspective, though what influence has the company on external factors. So, when it comes um, to disclosure requirements, um, there are some uh, company related requirements and product related obligations. I will not um, elaborate further on them um, now. Um, regarding the company, just to say it's the um, addressees have to transparently um, present their strategy regarding the inclusion of sustainable risks, which is quite important. You know, you know that is the linkage also to the risk management, yeah, including in risk management. And regarding the product related transparency, there are some obligations that are primarily to be fulfilled via pre-contractual information to clients. Um, I would like then uh, directly uh, go to the EBA and uh, the EBA standard on uh, transition and physical risks of climate change because it comes now closer to banks and closer to their, um, let's say, um, disclosure of their own activity. Um, so um, the one hand is um, to inform um, in potential investors about ESG, but here it comes um, to their own activity and their own businesses. Um, and here, um, there, there is the basis uh, coming, as I said before, from uh, CRR and the CRD. Uh, and the, CRD. the CRR requires disclosures in Part um, 8, in particular in Article 449A, and it gives a mandate to the um, EBA to draft uniform disclosure formats, and they do so. Um, these um, formats have to convey sufficiently comprehensive and comparable information. 
And this kind of information should enable users of this information to assess the risk profiles of the institution as such. Um, in developing the standard, the EBA draws on the recommendation of the Financial Stability Sports Task Force on climate-related financial disclosures, the Commission's non-binding guidelines on climate change reporting, and the EU taxonomy. And uh, there is an obje objective, and it is in, in the end to establish um, a comprehensive framework for relevant ESG disclosure requirements. So, well, when it comes to this, then um, we can say that they, there is um, there, there are two actually two mandates for the EBA. Um, one is the implementing standards, as I just said, on prudential disclosures on ESG risk. And the other one is to give advice to the Commission on KPIs, and they did so um, under the Article 8 of the Taxonomy Regulation, and I will um, come to that on the next slide. Um, there is um, synergies between both, which is good, and there is also an, a kind of an interrelation between both. So coming to the disclosure, and uh, don't worry, I don't want to read all of what, what is written down here. It's just to give you an idea about what is upcoming to um, financial institutions. Uh, they have to disclose in pillar three, and unfortunately, I would say the EBA is starting with disclosure before they come to integrating that in risk management. Yeah, so to get a flavor of what can be done and um, how is the information flowing and so. And you can see um, there are some certain uh, risk disclosures necessary, um, some um, disclosures about um, mitigating actions. And here it comes, um, what I would like to draw your attention to, and that is more or less the green asset ratio, um, because the green asset ratio is then um, to fulfill Article 8. And that represents the proportion of a credit institution's assets that are invested in taxonomy compliant environmentally sustainable economic activities. And um, here specifically uh, in those that um, fall under the reporting requirements of the CSR directive. Um, whereas when it comes to the banking book taxonomy alignment ratio, this represents um, actually the same ratio for taxonomy compliant economic activities that do not, do not fall under the reporting obligation of the CSR directive. Right, then coming to the next initiative a little bit more in detail, and this is Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is um, on the one hand fantastic, on the other hand for many companies it is a disaster. You can see that um, it replaces the non-financial reporting directive and um, there will be an um, expanded uh, group of addressees um, now going to 49,000 companies. When I, when I turn up, you know, I'm coming from Germany, um, up to now the non-financial reporting directives was addressed to about 500 companies and in the future it will be 15,000 uh, in Germany. And so you can imagine that uh, many, many of the companies are not really prepared up to now, for sure not, they cannot be, but there is a, a huge workload on them to fulfill the requirements. And then we will see that um, these requirements are then issued more or less by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. So there will be standards that um, um, specify the information that has to be disclosed on the three um, factors, environmental, social factors, and governance factors. Um, the, the question could arise, why at all should the EU Commission um, really come out with something um, when we know that there is an international um, activity going on um, coming uh, from the um, um, international financial reporting um, um, uh, initiatives there. Um, however, um, they have a mandate and they would like to uh, make use of that in order to um, bring comparable information in the financial statement. And the first thing is that it, that it will really be within the financial statement, so there is no uh, choice uh, where to place it anymore. It will be part of the management report. Second of all, um, uh, 
the um, EFRAC has published um, some drafts, and I will show you also the number of disclosure requirements. Only the number, don't worry, we don't have to go through all of them because there are more than 100 actually. Um, and the, the final drafts, um, they will be submitted, as I said, um, next week. So that is the plan um, after the analysis of the feedback that they have received. And I uh, will um, talk about that also um, now. You see the, the architecture of the exposure drafts on these um, kind of um, European sustainability reporting standards. It is a little bit to yeah, designed to ensure that sustainability um, information is, re is reported in a carefully articulated manner. But the point is just that they have a built, let's say, cross sectoral um, standards as an exposure draft for sure, but they will be um, then um, in the near future standards. Um, they have come out with some standards on um, environment, they have um, come out with standards on social and on governance. In total, if you see that, it is more than 130 different disclosure requirements. Yeah, you can count them here. It's more than 130 single disclosure requirements, which is a huge um, amount. What I just heard yesterday um, was um, that they will make maybe bring it down to a, a level of 80, but even 80 is um, quite a lot. They received more than 750 comment letters and most of the remarks were about the volume, the scope and the granularity. Um, and they said we, there is some, some need for synchronizing that with the CSRD and all of um, the um, comment letters um, said that there is a need for coordination with the ISSB and some con conceptual clarifications. Um, and I come to the last initiatives, which came from the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, here again, I will not go into depth, but um, it is um, required from companies that are uh, capital market oriented um, to also fulfill, fulfill those requirements. Up to now, they, they I have to say just or only came out with these um, um, drafts here. And then, uh, so the second um, draft with climate related disclosures, um, and uh, they will, there will be uh, many more standards on that. So I will come now to my, to my final remarks and uh, um, open some uh, questions um, for maybe our later discussion. Yeah. And uh, there is the first one, aligning and integrating ESG related information requirements are necessary. This is for sure, but there might be too many disclosure requirements from too many in initiatives to be fulfilled at the same time. That could be also confusing um, for the addressees. The quantity and quality, we have to consider whether quantity you know, is needed or quality, or if we deliver really both, that would be also good. We see some overlapping information. Um, the question is on which conceptual or theoretical uh, concepts are they based on and how will they be developed in the near future? Um, there are challenges in respect to reliability, consistency and comparability of these information um, over time and between companies. Um, when it regularity, um, has to be questions whether the data is available, specifically when it comes to banks. Um, and then um, on, on, on based on that, the, the question, what are the auditors doing? Yeah? Can, can that be audited? Because they will have to audit some of the figures with limited insurance. So the question is cost versus benefit in the very short run. Um, the conformit, um, conformity of the ESG related information and disclosures with the company's ESG commitments. Yeah, that is something someone has to uh, take care of that it is not what we just heard, um, greenwashing, yeah, targets, strategic de decisions, and the um, companies will really have to uh, integrate it in their, in their management and live it. And then um, again, this avoidance from greenwashing, what we just heard. And the last one is who is going to enforce that? Yeah, is it the ESMA? Is it for banks, um, the ECB? Is it both? The ESMA, as we heard this morning, yeah, they just came out with 
um, what they would like to focus on. And there is ESG related issue and ESG related issue um, just um, meant, was mentioned. So um, the ESMA is looking upon that. The ECB maybe um, will look upon that as well. But who is really um, um, taking um, that um, as their responsibility? With that, I would like to close and thank you for um, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for another absolutely excellent presentation and slides. Uh, I, I must say I'm envious of your ability to get through such a large swath of regulations and directives and guidance in, in standards and do it in such an accessible fashion and, and still leave time to, to, to uh, point us towards some of the sort of outstanding questions. So hopefully we'll get to some of those issues in the break. Um, but before we go to questions, if anyone has any questions, pop them in the chat function and we'll get to them. But before then, um, I'm delighted to, to hand over to our final speaker, um, Professor David ramos Munes, who's going to speak to us about uh, sustainability in credit ratings and benchmarks. So over to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Polonai. Um, just uh, one second to share the presentation. Okay. So here it is. Um, this, uh, I, first of all, I wish to thank, um, I wish to thank uh, Christos and, uh, and Philippa for the invitation to this conference and to Planet for the, for the introduction. I am uh, here thanks to, to that invitation. Also, uh, ESMA's uh, invitation as uh, co-organizer and participant here. Um, this uh, conference uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, inserted into a broader project that is funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation. But there's also uh, another reason why I'm here, and it's due to the law of, of comparative advantage, uh, because uh, probably, uh, as, as you will see, Michele and, uh, and uh, Matteo Gargantini uh, have worked on this, on this topic, but they were probably much more capable than I was to deal with the issue of uh, the ESMAS mandate, as Michele did in two presentations uh, before uh, than I was. That's the reason why the presentations were allocated in this way. So um, let me just focus on this. I will uh, I will try to uh, cover uh, four points. One is uh, concerns the basics to to frame the the discussion over ESG ratings and benchmarks. Then I will move on to some uh, market considerations of both, uh, and then I will move on to to provide some regulatory considerations. So how these two elements of the of the market and the market in sustainable instruments and sustainable companies can be addressed using uh, uh, as a basis a conceptual or analytical model based on the ideas of exit voice and penalty and coercion and hopefully this should lead to some uh, conclusions so some basics um, if we focus on EOSCO's report on ESG ratings and data products these are globally speaking largely unreg unregulated activities as we descend to the regional perspective of the EU, we have to differentiate uh, between ratings, which are not regulated ratings. Uh, ESG ratings do not fall within the scope of the credit rating agency regulation, and there are obstacles to the regulation in that, uh, within that, uh, that uh, regulation because they do not measure the probability of defaults like regular ratings do. Uh, there are other differences because although um, uh, there are some risk ratings that uh, focus on the outside in perspective, which could be more aligned with what uh, conventional rating agencies do. There are so-called impact ratings, which measure the impact of entities on ESG factors, providing an inside out perspective, which differs uh, more from the uh, evaluation or the business model of, of conventional rating agencies. As we move to benchmarks, Unlike ratings, benchmarks are regulated within the, the European Union. And this is due to the sequenced uh, or gradual approach of the benchmark regulation, which enables uh, uh, the possibility of distinguishing between non-significant ratings, uh, sorry, benchmarks that are subject to a system of registration and, and relatively lenient comply or explain, then significant uh, benchmarks which are subject to authorization or registration, uh, and then critical 
benchmarks which are subject to the more exacting uh, requirements. That makes it easier to bring benchmarks into the regulatory perimeter than it is, uh, as, uh, so far at least, for rating um, providers. Moving on to market considerations, uh, if we focus on the ESMA assessment, there is a variety of providers of, of ESG uh, ratings. We have conventional rating agencies, benchmark administrators, data vendors, and specialized firms. But the most important aspect is that, is that of concentration. Uh, there is a concentration, a geographical concentration within the, the European Union. Uh, there is also a diversification of the product offer. Most, uh, offer, uh, most entities that offer ESG ratings also offer other data products. And there is also a, a concentration by volume. This explains the wide disparity between average revenue and the median revenue as, as seen in the uh, assessment by, by ESMA of 2022. Why is that? Because ever since 2016, there has been a process of, com uh, of uh, concentration where the main global players, most of them uh, as, uh, outside the European Union, have been acquiring competitors to bolster their portfolio of, uh, of products that can be offered. So, so much so that we are now within the range of five, six uh, major players in, in this market, uh, which is again becoming an oligopolistic market. Is there uh, a correspondence between these uh, concentration movements on the supply side and the patterns of users on the on the demand side? Yes, uh, because 77% uh, of users of, of ratings say they use them very much, but they also say that they tend to use a combination of uh, ESG ratings and they tend to buy ratings as part of a package. That enhances the competitive position of those players that offer products other than ESG ratings. So uh, that complement that offering with other uh, products. As a result, users mostly or, or exclusively use ESG ratings from large market players. And this is confirmed across the different assessments, be it uh, the Commission assessment, the ESMA assessment, or the EOSCO assessment. Some other aspects uh, are that uh, users tend to uh, tend to complain about the the uh, lack of accuracy of the ratings, but they confess that they do not have a formal verification process and that they do not verify the accuracy in a systematic manner. They also tend to say that one of their priorities is the depth and breadth of coverage, which favors large players, but does not favor accuracy. So, in a way, users are complicit in these market trends. This leads to a situation that is not very encouraging. There is a, um, there is a, a lot of divergence uh, between ratings, plus uh, combining elements from the E, the S, and the G leads to odd results. For example, higher ESG rated companies tend on average to be uh, to pollute more in terms of gross gross output of carbon dioxide, which is something that a regular user of, of these ratings might be uh, surprised about. Users uh, in line of this complain that the market does not function well, is not transparent, is prone to conflict of interest. And so everyone uh, agrees that the market mal malfunctions, but everyone seems to be in a way complicit in this malfunction. As to the companies being assessed by the rating companies, uh, they tend to complain that this is a time consuming exercise, the one of filling the information for those raters, and that there is not enough opportunity to correct errors. But this in turn may favor very large players because if companies start discriminating as to which ratings uh, they want to focus more, they will tend to focus on the ratings provided by the large uh, players and, and feel the information more accurately for them, which reinforces the trend towards concentration. If we go to benchmarks, we tend to see very, a very similar pattern uh, in terms of the evolution of the market. The market is set to grow. Uh, this market is dependent on ratings, so there is, we are seeing uh, a, a relative uh, combination of, of, uh, of services consisting in ratings and benchmarks, and benchmarks also rely on, on ratings, uh, and the industry is becoming increasingly concentrated. 
as a result, uh, or maybe uh, as a correlated um, uh, event, uh, there tends to be a, um, a correlation between market capitalization of the companies and the uh, scoring under ESG benchmarks, meaning that large companies tend to be favored by ESG-based uh, benchmarks. Uh, and there's another factor that has been identified by some studies, which is that the approach based on exclusionary screening, meaning that the elaboration of ESG benchmarks is based on taking general benchmarks and excluding certain companies. This in practice leads to weighting more uh, certain sectors such as energy sector. So some may be surprised that uh, oil majors, for example, uh, may have a greater weight in an ESG friendly benchmark than under uh, a general uh, benchmark. Of course, this is an oversimplification, but this is, uh, effect has been assessed by, by some studies. So, in summary, the market grows. The market is not concentrating, will not concentrate, is already concentrating. This is already in the past and we should deal with this. And this has happened with regardless of, of regulation. Um, then, differentiating between ratings and benchmarks, uh, there seems to be an emphasis on quantity over quality. And there seems to be a lot of opacity in the way the ratings are, are uh, configured. In terms of benchmarks, there seems to be uh, both ratings and benchmarks. There seems to be a problem in mixing E, S, and G uh, considerations, leading to an overweight uh, or, or overweighting carbon majors and gen energy companies in general. So, with this picture, uh, what are the considerations that we may have when deciding how to regulate uh, these two uh, players? The three guiding ideas that I'm going to use is one, that the approach towards ratings and benchmarks should be consistent with the approach towards other market actors. And in this sense, I'm incredibly grateful to Edgar for having emphasized all the different elements, the different pieces of the puzzle of disclosure, because that exactly the point I'm going to build on. But second, we, what, we, ha, we need clarity and a frank discussion as to what are the goals we want to achieve and what are the levers or the dynamics that we intend to use to achieve those goals. That leads us to the framework that I'm proposing based on the three ideas of exit, voice, and, and I say that I use voice a little, a, a little liberally, talking more about dialogue-based mechanisms, and then penalty and coercion. Under exit-based dynamics, the uh, rationale is one is an economic rationale. It's based on competition and the idea that investors should be uh, allowed to vote with a fit and invest in green investments or sustainable investments and divest in non-sustainable investments. That uh, preference is fostered by enhancing the uh, transparency and disclosure through capital markets rules. Under a voice-based or dialogue-based uh, dynamic, the, the idea is more uh, between uh, economics and political science, because the idea is to correct objection and objectional state of affairs through engagement and by changing the conversation in shareholders meetings, in boards, in credit risk committees, etc. That gives prominence to the role of gatekeepers, financial, inter financial intermediaries, etc. Finally, under uh, the penalty or coercion uh, dynamic, uh, this uh, responds to a more legal uh, or pre purely legal. Um, uh, uh, framework because the idea is to sanction reprehensible behavior. So the behavior of firms that either uh, pollute or, or, or um, hinder uh, some of the or cause significant harm to one of the uh, sustainability goals or misrepresent facts of risk in washing or breach fiduciary duties. So using this framework, what do we have? The, this, uh, this is basically a simplification of, of the market where we have the companies that disclose information and then we have uh, sustainability rating providers, benchmark administrators and credit rating agencies. Uh, there was not enough space for auditors, Edgar, I'm sorry, but they would be included among the gatekeepers. Those act as a sort of filter for the information 
that is in turn used by banks for lending purposes and by financial market participants to report information to the market and their clients, and then by investment firms who offer products to those clients. So each of these uh, nodes of the network are subject to different regulations. We have the taxonomy uh, as a general type of regulation, but then we have MIFID for investment firms, Sustainability Financial Disclosure Regulation for financial market participants, the CRR for banks, etc. So when we talk about the benchmark regulation for benchmark administrators and uh, the possibility of regulating sustainability rating providers, we need to be aware that under a uh, um, exit based uh, dynamic, Anything that we say with regard to those market players needs to be consistent with the idea that they would be acting as uh, as gatekeepers for all the other uh, players in the market. So anything that we say needs to be consistent. So, and here we come to a juncture. We need to understand what is the goal that we, sh we wish to achieve through this regulation. If we adopt an investor-led perspective, and, and this is to some extent present in, in the paper by uh, Matteo Gargantini and Michele Siri, the goal is to cater to investor preferences. And in that way, we need to be aware of the diversity of investors who may be uh, risk-based or impact-based, et cetera. We are very much aware of the difference between ESG rating providers and conventional rating agencies because the two do not measure the, the same things. Uh, we cannot be dictatious as to the process by which uh, providers uh, elaborate the ratings. And uh, we should be reluctant towards the integration of ESG factors into the assessment of credit risk by CRAs or credit ma mainstream or conventional rating agencies. However, and, and this is perfect if this is the goal. If, uh, if the goal is to cater to investor preferences, then we are fine uh, as such. But if the goal is another, if the goal is to achieve a tr the carbon neutral or the climate transition, I don't think that's enough. And, and that's the problem. Because if markets are a means to achieve the transition, then the approach uh, changes. Uh, first of all, we realize that improving the quantity and quality of information is a means to create supply in order to create demand. And in that sense, uh, mixing E, S, and G components is probably not a good idea because simply by flooding information, we are not going to create uh, demand, I'm afraid. Conversely, Focusing on climate change as a core consent, uh, uh, prioritizing it can improve the reliability and the accuracy of information and put it on a level with financial information. That also, uh, another consideration is that a more intrusive approach may be warranted with regard to certain products that are particularly sensitive in that regard. To a certain extent, we see that in the case of benchmarks with, uh, with more interventionist approach towards climate transition benchmarks and Paris aligned benchmarks. And uh, we could see a similar development in the case of ratings. Um, when it comes to, um, to the link between ESG ratings and conventional ratings, I'm afraid that in order to bolster the credentials of ESG ratings, there should be some kind of link because it would be a way of introducing uh, ESG considerations into what is the bread and butter of risk management of, of uh, uh, institutional investors and financial market participants. However, and this is another conclusion, if the transition is the ultimate goal, exit-based strategies are probably not going to be enough. And that explains the transition from exit to voice, because with this same diagram, we start having different considerations and different players. Who are these players? So those players uh, or those elements are the presence of engagement policies in, among financial market participants and investment firms, uh, together with the role of proxy advisors on one side, so that's the capital market side, but also the dialogue between the bank supervisor and banks through the supervisory review and evaluation process. That is what fosters change through dialogue with boards and, and risk management committees. 
If we look at this from this perspective, what are the challenges here? On one hand, it becomes necessary to pay attention to different types of ratings, uh, not only risk-based, but also impact-based, because the dialogue may go in different directions in the shareholders meeting and the board. But at the same time, a competing consideration is the need of consistency across the investment chain and the need to avoid at all cost that an increase in information makes that information woolly or weak and does not give rise to a, a structured dialogue and constructive dialogue. In that sense, uh, the, there is a real difficulty here because so far the regulatory framework makes very little uh, reference uh, in capital markets, at least, on engagement policies. There are very limited references in this regard. Second, benchmarks tend to focus in a relatively mechanistic way on the presence or absence of ESG governance and compliance systems, but not on the effectiveness of those systems and how they foster change in practices. As to the supervisory review and evaluation process, the problem is that in addition to focusing on governance and risk management where a real transition is taking place, the SREP also requires a business model analysis to establish risk levels. And this is essentially a quantitative exercise. A quantitative exercise does not sit very well with just qualitative indicators. And this is why the need for ratings to adapt by providing some sort of quantitative basis to strengthen the hand of the supervisor in the dialogue also becomes even more necessary. Again, a focus on climate may help to improve this structure. Finally, in the interest of time, I'm going to go very briefly on, on the third uh, issue. If we focus on penalty and coercion, we have the possibility of investors enforcing the rights, securities markets enforcing uh, conduct rules or licensing requirements, or bank supervisors imposing extra capital requirements. If we look at this from, if we look at benchmarks and ratings from this perspective, there is a major gap in the possibility of enforcing uh, investor protection rules that has to do with the concept of materiality and the idea of reliance by investors. There is also a major challenge uh, in enforcing licensing rules, well, mostly because rating providers are unregulated, so there's no way to enforce licensing requirements. And conduct rules need clarity as to what they wish to achieve in order to be properly enforced. So how to, how to tackle these problems? Well, one way is, is to focus on the idea of, uh, uh, in, on a dynamic approach that focuses on the exclusion or downgrading as a basis for a materiality claim by investors. That is one possibility, linking these elements. Uh, by regulating ratings as a subset of data products subject to stricter regulation that gives rise to enforcement in case of breach of that regulation. And also by, again, linking ratings uh, of, of on EHG variables with bank-like risk, because that strengthens the hand of the supervisor. Again, I insist probably focusing on climate uh, change information or climate information can help uh, to strengthen these aspects. So by way of conclusion, we have a market of benchmarks and ratings that is growing much, is concentrating uh, very much, is already concentrated, and a current regulatory approach that is primarily based on exit-based dynamics and investor-led dynamics. This may be acceptable if this is what the legislator wishes to achieve, but it's probably not enough if the ultimate goal is the climate transition. Voice-based and penalty coercion-based strategies need to be enlisted as well. And the way to do so, or the one I'm proposing, is to do a dual distinction uh, to enable a core periphery regulation of these providers, distinguishing between critical versus simply relevant information on one side, and by distinguishing climate as a core subset of information regulated more strictly, and, as, uh, and then the rest of ESG uh, type of information. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, uh, thank you very much for listening to, to the presentation. 
Thank you very much, David. And um, despite that, what we can now see was an overly modest self introduction uh, to, to this area. I think you've reviewed a very complicated but important area um, and also provided a very original framework um, uh, for uh, going forward. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions before we move to the next session. So just while we're waiting for some, I, I'm going to uh, use my prerogative as chair and ask uh, a question each uh, of you. Um, so, Edgar, one thing I was wondering that related to, to your last slide, uh, you were talking about, you asked the question whether there were too many disclosure requirements um, and whether that's leading to sort of unreliable information. And we've seen a lot of, of, of the, the, the sort of the weaknesses in that information revealed in, in David's presentation too. And I'm wondering what sort of uh, advice you can give to auditors dealing with this, you know, how should they proceed, but not just auditors, because uh, another sort of set of gatekeepers that I think perhaps isn't mentioned uh, enough is uh, the board. So directors on a board who are also charged with oversight. So how do they work through um, you know, the, the, the disclosures to, to, to make a determination as to whether uh, for example, the classification is correct or whether the risk management is enough. So uh, just a, a focus on auditors and perhaps directors, um, Edgar. And then David, as, as a, a follow up question to you. Um, in your framework, you've, you've taken us from the sort of the exit based dynamics, which move then into the voice based dynamics, and then the two of them will apply in the penalty based dynamics. Um, but I wonder if you if you um, think there is a tension between those dynamics and how that tension plays out or how it can be resolved. So uh, oh, oh, perhaps Edgar, you might kick off on sure, those. Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a high relevant question that you are raising for sure. Let, let me start by saying the following. Um, currently, we are in a phase where we are using for disclosure pass and single part of that, the non-financial reporting directive based on that. Um, that addresses the responsibilities to if you have a two board system to the supervisory board members. Interesting. In the future, um, due to the CSR report, it will change because it will be part of the management reporting. So the mandatory management reporting, but then the board of directors will be responsible for, for that. We could see in the, in the past to now that the supervisory or um, supervisory board members usually use um, the, the support of auditors uh, in order to get the information. Um, that they that they need. When it comes to the to the auditors, the question now and for the future is: Will be the auditor um, who also audits the financial statements, which I would prefer because they have a um, insight into that. But it is not said that they have uh, the obligation to do that. So you could also ask um, a different, for example, audit company as. Um, most commonly used that it's audit companies um, doing that. And then the question, the next question is, it comes to limited assurance for the um, auditors. So that makes it um, nicer on the one hand. On the other hand, you will not recognize something in what is called key audit matters. So in a separate section where the auditors um, point out um, what they are focusing on, because as it is just limited assurance and in the management report, it cannot be a key um, audit matter. On the other hand, the many information that, that, that they have to check uh, leads to a, a point where I have um, doubts that they can, that companies really can fulfill all the requirement, uh, requirements at once. So there should be an, a certain kind of a paragraph where the auditor could write up to the certain extent they fulfill the requirements. On the other hand, I don't know what capital market uh, participants will think about that because it's it's not a um, qualified um, a qualified remark, but it is a signal, and uh, this kind of signal is really dangerous. On the other hand, how can the auditors make sure that they are in line? The companies are really in line with the requirements, so it is a, a certain tension there, and I'm keen on um, the discussions that that we will have in the near future, and also to, in a certain way, 
to manage um, the, the the gap that might arise from the horizon of the of the shareholders or stakeholders there. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's really interesting, and I wonder whether it's going to change the skill set requirements, you know, along the way as well. As well. Not just yeah. auditors, but but as I say, boards. So, thank you. Uh, I think a, a lot more discussion is needed on that one. Um, David, could we turn to you, please? Thank you very much, uh, Planet. Um, yes, um, I think that that the point you you just made uh, is is a relevant one. Although I have presented the, the three uh, dynamics of exit voice and, and penalty as being um, one building on the other, there is certainly a, a tension with some of the uh, of the proposals that, that I make. Uh, on one side, there is a tension between emphasizing the importance of risk-based, climate-focused uh, ratings and benchmarks uh, as a sort of core that is used by supervisors and risk-based investors, and simultaneously improving the quality of the conversation across other ESG factors or giving voice to impact-based investors. I suppose that the only answer to this is to let the market fill that gap, for example, by uh, through the role of activist investors on, on climate-related or non-climate-related but ESG-related matters. They are becoming increasingly uh, active and sophisticated, and it would be their job to fill that gap. Uh, so there is here uh, one uh, question mark. Another one is uh, the tension between a stricter regulation of certain types of products, like, for example, climate-related ES, uh, ESG ratings, uh, ratings, I emphasize the ratings as opposed to other di data products on one side, and limiting over-reliance by investors, because investors could perceive that there is a sort of regulatory license uh, to, uh, with regard to these products. And, uh, and I suppose that there is uh, no clear uh, mitigating factor to this other than to require financial intermediaries to build the capacity to challenge the ratings and make the decisions not only based on ratings. That's uh, one, one answer to, to the question. Plus, on the other side, uh, regulators cannot do everything. So there is already a reliance on ratings and there is already a market concentration, even before regulating it. So at some point, uh, regulators need to decide whether the priority is, you know, competition or the priority is transition. Thank you. Thank you. That's that, that's very clear. Um, we are just coming up to our to our a lot of time. So if there is uh, if anyone has a, a, a quick question and they want to unmute and ask, do otherwise. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, it, it just remains to me then to to thank uh, our um, uh, our uh, three excellent presenters. It, you know, as they say, it, it's a complicated area, and as all three have said, there really is no uh, clear answer. Um, I, I think we're we're seeing more impediments and more challenges, and you know, taking away a slightly, uh, I think, pessimistic. Um, a, a view of the area, um, but certainly one that we have greater clarity in now, thanks to these three speakers. So uh, thank you all. And uh, I will uh, hand over now to the uh, chair of the next session. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, uh, last uh, panel of this excellent conference. It is a great pleasure, I should say, having been involved in the, in the preparation of this excellent seminar online, uh, together with, with our chair of the academic board, Christos Gorzos and Filippo Annunziata, to, to chair this, this last panel, combining here uh, scientific compl complicity with friendship with several of the of the panelists, which, which is always a good thing and, and a great pleasure. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, I, shall, um, I shall address uh, the key points that we'll be covering in this last roundtable session. As you all know, 
the overall topic, or I should say that the light motive of this panel is effectiveness and enforcement in regulating and supervising capital markets in the European Union. And I think that we are very fortunate today to have a, a great group of remarkable panelists who need no introduction for a learned audience. So I'll be extremely brief in referring to each of them following the order of the program. We shall have uh, Marco Lamandini from Bologna University and EBI covering the subtopic of enforcement and proportionality in light of the recent European Court of Justice jurisprudence. Uh, we shall then have Ferl Collard from Leuven University and also EBI covering the subtopic of conduct rules and capital markets uh, in, private, in private enforcement as an open debate. Then we shall proceed with uh, Francesca Meda from CONSOB covering the subtopic of enforcement and supervision in the decentralized world. And we will finalize with two interventions by Matteo Gargantini from the University of Genoa and EBI. Matteo will cover the, the subtopic, the prevention of market abuse, the role of RegTech and SubTech. And finally, uh, last in the order of the program, but not, it, not, not the least, we have Rolf Zett from the University of Zurich and EBI covering the subtopic of the role of financial uh, literacy. We have roughly one hour and 45 minutes available. And so to keep it as stimulating as possible for our online audience, I would suggest the first round of, of interventions. I would ask uh, now uh, to each panelist for a brief opening statement, considering the, the key uh, topic that he will be covering and also on the basis of the overall thematic leitmotiv of, of, of this conference. And we should try then to have a second round of complementary shorter interventions plus some critical discussion between, between all, the, um, all, all, all the panelists. Allow me just a final word be before giving the floor to, to my good friend Marco, uh, just a final word to, to set the scene of this last panel uh, dedicated to effectiveness and enforcement in regulating and supervising capital markets in the European Union to echo here very briefly the initial words today of Verena Ross in her keynote intervention that launched this seminar this morning, underlying the, the crucial importance of the enforcement dimension, which is sometimes overlooked, and the decisive relevance of some degree of convergence, I would dare say, of consistency of enforcement in the field of European regulation and supervision of capital markets. And I think that another related point, which deserves critical attention, is the current degree of sometimes excessive financial complexity of financial regulation, lato senso as a whole, and sound enforcement patterns may be decisive to deal with the drawbacks of this excessive complexity. But enough for me. I would now, without further ado, give the floor to my good colleague and friend, uh, Marco Lamandini, for his first intervention. Thank you very much. Marco. Thank you very much, Luis. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, so many friends. And actually, in our session, we are back. Uh, into the old uh, known world, uh, familiar world, so to say, after so many beautiful sessions this morning and in the early afternoon, uh, which were an imaginative or imaginative bridges towards uh, the future in its making. Um, it's a privilege, obviously, talking about the past because there is no great expectation in the audience. And I would start uh, with an obvious uh, remark the enforcement of the law of finance in Europe uh, is a multidimensional exercise. European and national planes, private law and public law dimensions uh, coexist. And this is um, something that uh, we are familiar with uh, also in antitrust. Here, however, this happens in a quite special institutional setting, and this has its own implications. There are therefore a few distinct challenges for effectiveness and enforcement, and I will try to be brief, but touch on them. An exemplary challenge for effectiveness, in my view, is in the private law dimension, and it comes from the national causes of actions. I guess that this point will be also touched later on. But my problem is causes of actions are rarely harmonized due to the principle of procedural autonomy. David, David Ramos and myself discussed this issue last year in EULO Live commenting Bankia, where the court held that Article 6 of the Prospectus Directive at the time 
granted the member states broad margin to determine the conditions to exercise an action for damages for false information in the prospectus, but that the principles of equivalence and effectiveness must be respected. This finding was in line with set of case law, such as uh, Hirman and Craignest, yet the Court of Justice uh, acrobatics between procedural autonomy and effectiveness seemed to us at the time a very elegant uh, tiptoeing on a tight rope suspended a little bit between past and future. Because if private litigation should contribute to the enforcement, it seems to us quite clear that the capital market union and the banking union are in a quite sorry state as to the civil remedies for private law disputes, which remain fully balkanized in a variety of national modes. There is nothing new in this because I remember Burkhardes, Nim Maloney, and many others, Danny Bush, many others contributed on that in the past. A good example, I rem remind now uh, works uh, from, from Danny Bush, uh, who emphasized, for instance, the importance of uh, Ganil, the Ganil case, where the Court of Justice held that in the case of investment firm, uh, which did not comply with MIFID duties, MIFID provides for administrative sanctions actions, but is silent on the private law causes of actions, which are left to member states, uh, although it also stipulates that this must be without prejudice to the principle of effectiveness. Uh, this, however, can result, uh, just to make an example, in Spanish courts' preference for nullity or invalidity, and for the Italian courts' preference for contractual liability, with very little guidance. Uh, 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 from the general principle of effectiveness uh, so far. Obviously, the EU legislators can ignore all this, uh, uh, but the question is, for how long? Uh, we all know that the Credit Rating Agency Regulation 3, the one of 2013, established a new cause of action, a European one, for private litigation when a credit rating agency intentionally or negligently breaches the regulation and an investor suffers damage. Yet, uh, this is uh, still an isolated exception. So, uh, my first uh, point is, uh, I don't need to be a Cassandra to predict uh, that uh, in the context of the banking union and the capital market union, it comes uh, a point where the procedural autonomy of member states impairs uh, the EU law principles of equivalence and effectiveness. And uh, to be honest, in the context of consumer credit, uh, the Court of Justice made clear last May 2022 that this point has been already reached for unfair term, uh, terms uh, in the Banco di Desio, Bercaja Banco, Impulse, and uh, Unicaia Banco uh, cases where actually procedural autonomy has finally surrendered to effectiveness of EU law. So this as to the private law uh, uh, perspective, so to say. If we come very, very sh shortly to the public law enforcement, uh, this presents in turn, in my view, its uh, special challenges. Uh, they, are, they are so many that uh, they would be worth a treatise. Luckily, I should simply concentrate on proportionality, and I will just touch very, very shortly on three points. First, proportionality in a public law perspective is a principle which, to my mind, may, on one hand, guide the legislators in designing proportionate enforcement measures and sanctions, or constrain supervisors' discretion, uh, what Advocate General Emilio uh, uh, a few days ago uh, called uh, technical uh, discretion uh, 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 in applying those measures and, uh, and sanctions. This is uh, obviously different, uh, and this difference has practical implications because constitutional courts and the Court of Justice for the European legislators uh, obviously reign over the first area, whereas the second area is a breeding ground of complexities uh, revolving around the still elusive question of the standard of review for national and European courts uh, over supervisors' uh, discretion. Uh, the opinion of Advocate General Emilio of last 27 October in Credilione uh, uh, is certainly a very welcome addition to the debate in this domain, and uh, I guess uh, it may uh, really help in bringing much ab uh, about much better clarity, but uh, still we need to wait for the judgment of the court. 
Uh, meanwhile, in the uh, cap capital market union, an exemplary illustration of this dichotomy, proportionate legislative design versus uh, uh, proportionate uh, supervisors implementation can be found in NESMA sanctioning powers in scope rating, the joint board of appeal, acknowledged uh, uh, that in the uh, credit rating agency regulation, that the same is valid also for EMIR, the law establishes uh, itself a proportionate criteria for the quantification of sanctions, which obviously constrain ESMA discretion, but if sanctions are proportionate by design, there is then no need for an ex post proportionality check by courts or quasi courts at the level of the enforcement, obviously provided that the supervisor has applied the law as it stands. But as Federica Cameli in a, a, a forthcoming article actually noted, things are different for critical benchmark administrators and data reporting service providers, because here, uh, ESMA discretion in the quantification of sanction is not constrained by legislative criteria and thus courts need to check ex post if the principle of proportionality has been respected on a case by case basis. Second point, and then I'm coming to the conclusion. My second point is if a sanction of, or enforcement measure qualifies as a criminal sanction, this obviously enhances the role for a proportionality test. Thus, uh, the proportionality question is very often intertwined with the question, uh, in the case law at least, uh, on whether an enforcement measure is criminal in nature. And in cases like uh, Spectre Photo or DB versus Consob, uh, the court, uh, as we all know, uh, concluded that some of the administrative sanctions are actually criminal in nature. And invariably, therefore, national and European full review of sanction is called to struggle with the meaning of the proportionality pre uh, principle uh, in the factual specificities of each individual uh, case. Just to stay at the European level, in uh, DQ uh, versus ECB, the General Court dismissed the applicant's allegation that the penalty was disproportionate. Uh, why this? Because the legal provisions were clear and unequivocal, and the applicant continued with its behavior in breach of the rules after being warned by the joint supervisory teams. The court also rejected the claim that the publication of the sanction has caused a disproportionate damage to the bank. In the Credit Agricole case, instead, the court annulled in part an administrative penalty, but uh, instead of holding that the penalty was disproportionate, it emphasized, uh, as we did also the appeal panel in some circumstances, the demanding standard of the duty to state reasons in this particular uh, domain. I come to my third and final point. Uh, there are more doubts, obviously, uh, about the coloration penal of supervisory measures, but also in this context, proportionality is often claimed as a shield when supervisory measures or enforcement measures are applied and then are challenged before the Court of Justice. In Berlusconi II, so the case uh, T913, uh, uh, which is now on appeal in joint cases uh, uh, 512 and 513, uh, 22, the General Court dismissed the appellant's allegation that the ECB refusal of the acquisition of a significant holding due to concerns about uh, the good repute of the acquirer was disproportionate. In AAB, the General Court held uh, that the withdrawal of the license was proportionate and rejected the appellant's argument about the necessity of the measure, holding that alternative measures uh, such uh, as uh, the self-liquidation or the temporary cessation of the banking activity were insufficient to remedy the breaches. In Verso Bank, as uh, we all know, the General Court even highlighted the structured and uh, comprehensive proportionality analysis that the ECB considered uh, uh, and uh, uh, also the fact that the ECB had rejected uh, all possible alternatives. As we see, and I conclude, administrating, ad administrating a principle such as proportionality to navigate a complex environment of rules is uh, not an easy task for either the supervisory authority and the courts, but in my view at least, it is uh, 
a nice and very welcome necessity because it helps uh, doing justice, showing that uh, all relevant elements of facts are carefully weighted and rightly and duly calibrated and the power is never misused. Many thanks, Marco, for your, as always, illuminating considerations and your three final points on proportionality. There's a lot of food for thought to which I hope we may come back in the, in the second round, namely as regards uh, the possibility of a, a devolution of the standard of review uh, on account of uh, proportionality developments. But let's keep it for the second round. And for the moment, I would give the floor to uh, Ferl Collard addressing her topic, Conduct Rules and Private Enforcement, an open debate. Fel, it's always a pleasure. Last time it was even greater in Lisbon in person, but now we have to do it by video. Fel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luis, for your very kind words indeed. Likewise, very happy to see uh, you and all of you again. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak here today on a topic which is very close to my heart because it goes back uh, to my um, thesis, my doctoral thesis, actually. And let me maybe start with uh, stating what this thesis is. It's um, um, focusing a bit on one particular set of rules, the MIFID conduct of business rules. And then again, I will um, talk about private and public enforcement and how they relate to each other. Um, you all know what the MIFID conduct of business rules are about. They start with a general, what I call duty of care. The investment firm should act honestly, fairly and professionally in accordance with the best interests of the client. And then you have a whole range of other more specific conduct of business rules, including a suitability test, uh, information requirements and so on. So my thesis is that um, the MIFID conduct of business rules are actually part of private law. Private law indeed regulates the relationship between two private parties. In this case, this is the relationship between financial institution and the investor. They have been implemented, these rules, in most member states, if not all, in public law. But the only reason for that is because the only the public enforcement, um, as Marco already uh, said, has been harmonized, whereas private enforcement is not harmonized. But that doesn't change the nature of the rules themselves as private law. And that means that because of um, the fact that MIFID conduct of business rules provide maximum harmonization, this means that this also extends to the civil law duties of care in the relationship between the investment firm and the investor. And so that means that in interpreting civil law duties of care of investment firms, judges should not go beyond the MIFID II standard of behavior. This has a whole range of consequences in certain jurisdictions. This is um, not surprising. In Belgium, nobody will um, find this strange. But in some other member states, and namely in, in Germany and also in the Netherlands, this is really um, like saying something totally unacceptable because there there is really the public law conduct of business rules and the private law civil law duties of care which are distinct regimes and then one can have an impact on the other but we, they will not go any further so my thesis is this is private law conduct of business rules is private law and you shouldn't look at where it has been implemented because indeed if you look at where these rules come from it is eu law and the EU legislator does not distinguish between public and private law. So they just harmonize one behavioral standard and they can be enforced in different ways, public enforcement or private enforcement, but the standard should be the same. Obviously, private enforcement is not harmonized. Um, we have the general case already mentioned by um, Marco saying that there is the principle of effectiveness, so there should be some possibility of private enforcement. Um, the standard is harmonized, but other elements are not. For instance, when is causation accepted? What sanctions are there? Um, is it damages? Is it the nullity of the contract? Who bears the burden of proof? So in private enforcement, indeed, very different outcomes are possible in terms of actual investor protection, even though the same standard um, of behavior should apply by the investment firm. So, my thesis, if I can go on, is um, coming back to that. 
maximum harmonization of the conduct of business rules means that any conflicting legislation and also jurisprudence should be abolished. And so the duty of care in civil law should be contained or curtailed in the relationship investment firm uh, investor to what the conduct of business rules allow. Um, I will not go into the details. I found some very interesting references in the preparatory documents of MIFID. Um, I'm just citing now from uh, European Commission's justification for the MIFID 1 implementing directive rather than an implementing regulation. There the Commission stated that in order to enable member states when transposing its provisions into national law to not only adjust its requirements to the specificities of their particular markets, but also ensure coherence with other bodies of the law, they chose for a directive. And the example they give is that this is an area that is also governed by member states civil law. And so this should not imply that legal provisions in civil law area, which are inconsistent with the MIFID, um, they should be repealed. Okay, let me conclude. What does that mean? The civil law duties of care should not go beyond MIFID 2 standard of behavior. If you have a separate civil law standard of behavior that would deviate from the MIFID 2 uh, conduct of business rules, that would violate the maximum harmonization character of MIFID 2, and it would harm the level playing field between investment firms and credit institutions of different member states. Um, does that mean that the MIFID conduct of business rules are a straight jacket, and will this have a huge impact on national civil law? The answer is no, because as I just started my uh, presentation with citing the MIFID duty of care, that is an open standard. It is just an open standard to act professionally in the best interest of the client, which is very similar to the MIFID law duty of care. And so it is an open standard which needs case law to make it more concrete. And obviously case law can differ in the different member states, but very important as a consequence of the, the thesis I defend is that civil law judges can and should submit questions for a preliminary ruling to the court of justice in case of interpretation difficulties on the MIFID conduct of business rules. That is their duty. And in that way, uh, an harmon harmonization in the entire European Union is possible. Moreover, it means that the civil law judge and also the Court of Justice of the European Union should take regulatory guidance from ESMA guidelines, best practices into account when interpreting its national civil law duty of care in the relationship investment firm investor. The civil law judge should obviously, that was a general case, ensure effectiveness of the conduct of business rules. So they should not apply less strict standards. That does not mean that non-compliance will necessarily lead to a civil law sanction because there are other conditions in civil law which are not harmonized. Maybe there's no causal link which is fulfilled and then non-compliance might not lead to a civil law sanction. It shows that there's a different finality between public enforcement and private enforcement. Finally, the civil law judge should not go beyond the requirements of specific conduct of business rules, for instance, information obligations. And there you see that it can have a curtailing effect. For instance, in many jurisdictions, um, civil law judges will require specific warnings, even in non-advised cases, which goes beyond MIFID's information and know your customer requirements. In my view, that is not possible and that is hard. Um, violating the maximum harmonization character of MIFID. So, my final conclusion is there's one standard of behavior which can be enforced privately and publicly. Um, one standard of behavior, but still not one standard of protection because only the standard of behavior is harmonized and not the way it is enforced privately. And so indeed there is a lot of work there, but that was uh, part of the presentation of what uh, Marco said. So I will keep it to this and I'm um, very uh, happy to hear comments on this. Many thanks, Ferl. Uh, most interesting your approach on this difficult dichotomy between public and private enforcement in the domain of market conduct rules and, and, and patterns. And with the particular insight of your dissertation thesis, we shall have ample opportunity, I hope, to come back to, to, to some points. 
Uh, I would now give the floor, following the order of the program, to Francesca Meda uh, for her to cover her uh, subtopic enforcement and supervision in the decentralized world. Francesca, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you to everyone. I have to say thank you to Filippo, but you probably know Filippo better than me, but you know that he's a little crazy. And um, so, a little bit. So the, I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in a group of people, very, I have been, a, it was very interesting for me, but I am a, a, an economist. I'm a financial expert and worse than, than this, I'm an engineer. So I, you will receive, a, a, so it will be a little bit different than my, my, my presentation. Uh, I will not speak as consob, but I will speak as a full professor of applied finance of UCL. Uh, but of course, by being consob, I'm using this, uh, this experience that I'm having here, uh, just to find the links. Uh, exactly, and my uh, theme today will be exactly when we have to write a regulation, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to work together and we have to understand the languages that sometimes is very difficult and very different from each other. I call the language that they speak here in Consob, the financial authority, Consobian, because it's a mysterious, archaic language that I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to understand, but it's still difficult for me. So, okay, so let's start uh, to talk about uh, decentralized finance. So when we talk about uh, crypto assets and crypto asset markets, and we look at the um, recent year, we look at the uh, growth of a market that has been evolving in a really exponential way. And from different perspectives, you look at that uh, in terms of scale, in terms of size, in terms of structure, and also in, in uh, increasing the interconnection. This means that when we have all these aspects, uh, you talk about a high level of vulnerabilities. And I will use these terms uh, on purpose. So I use the terms vulnerabilities because this is a terms that we use in technology. So digital people talk about vulnerability and you in law, you don't use this term vulnerability sometimes, but I would like to alert you, use this term as is the term when you have to enter and introduce regulation maybe. So, you know, in 2023, we enter in the pilot regime for market infrastructure based on distributed ledger. The initiative has two main goal first to facilitate a secondary market of infrastructure and digital securities but above all to help the eu regulator to create a, a regulatory system and framework for this type of market okay so we are entering really into the DeFi world um, what is a decentralized finance? A decentralized finance is an umbrella that um, covers a variety of services in crypto assets market and aims to replicate the function of the traditional financial market. Okay, but the two characteristic fundamental in DeFi is the disintermediation of provision and the decentralization of governance. We have to remember these two aspects in order to, to understand how it works. Now, DeFi, in attempting to replicate some of the function of the traditional financial system, have some vulnerability, of course. This vulnerability, we are talking about vulnerability towards the financial stability. Um, and this vulnerability are the classic of vulnerability that, we saw, that all of you know, but also a, a twist created by the technology. And they, this the technology twist uh, create an amplification of the uh, vulnerability and plus create a new vulnerability. So I will stop uh, to talk about two specific ones. There are so many, but uh, okay, I will stop on two because they are interesting perhaps for all of you. Uh, what I wanted to say is uh, in uh, May 2022, you know that there was been a, a big turmoil in the crypto asset uh, market. We have the collapse of Terra Luna uh, platform with 16 billion uh, dollar wipeout uh, completely from the digital current space. What has shown that? That the traditional finance is not heavily exposed to DeFi, not yet. So is reflecting that the conservatory approach of the supervision and regulation has worked. So still the two worlds are separated. So there is no 
exposure on a stream. But nonetheless, we have to be very careful because the world is advancing. And so we have to move very fast and look at how to prevent this kind of connection because this is the major, major vulnerability. So I will speak about two things, governance and smart contract, because I think all of you probably knows what I'm talking about. So governance in DeFi is the governance of DeFi protocols, so of the computer protocol. And what we do in the in DeFi protocols, uh, I have to say, I'm uh, not only I'm a, so I can write code because, as I told you, I'm an engineer, so I'm a person that <laughs> I'm a, I, I, I can make. Uh, I, I know exactly how how it works. But the 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 point here in governance is that we know. In governance, you refer of the scope of decision making, the process, how you make the decision, and how also you implement the decision. Sorry, I was looking at the time. I didn't. Okay, I didn't start. Sorry, uh, but I think uh, uh, Louise, tell me when. We I have think. time. We have time. Ah, okay. We have leeway. So governance is therefore a, a problem with different levels because we have say scope, process, implementation. And so different level, different level of ownership of who does who and also accountability. One problem is certainly that in EFI we have not one single governance, but we have a variety of governance. And this is a potential adverse consequence for the financial stability because we cannot create a one single rule because we have a, such a broad variety. And uh, the confronting of governance structure uh, it's also problematic for us as a regulator because often the governance structure is uh, unclear, is opaque, is untested, and also very easy to manipulate from the financial point of view. And now I give you some example just to understand better what I'm saying. So market mani manipulation 2021, the estimated value of market manipulation within uh, this uh, DeFi is about us, but with one particular uh, type of manipulation, which is called rug pools, is $7.7 .7 billion in one year. Of that, uh, we had a more recent one, 2022, 11 of October, Mango Market Platform, $117 million stolen, caused by this rug pool activity. $570 million uh, again stolen 7 of October through a blockchain system linked with, to Binance. So the level of manipulation is quite high. Here we manipulate a price. When you look at, the, at, the, at the, the, the explanation, you still hear people talking about hacking. You know, like a, it is a, a, a digital problem. It's not. <laughs> this is a price manipulation in the perfect sense of the word. And uh, therefore we are talking about market manipulation. Uh, here, the, the, I will try to explain why I think this, we are talking about the price manipulation and market manipulation, not just hacking. Because hacking is something technical. I just have to adjust something. No, this is uh, something more complex. The fundamental problem is that it, it is intrinsic to the FI and because we have a mismatch between developer and founder and investor. We are confronting when we are in the governance of uh, DeFi have a problem of moral hazard where I have unclear and undisclosed knowledge of the objective of the developers as well as the founders of the DeFi platform and they therefore may have no incentive to decrease their exposure to risk and therefore will not have any problem because they will not bear the full cost of the risk if they expose the risk to the investor. So at this point is not anymore, so we are talking anymore, not hacking that I can adjust with a code, but we have to address this specific, this is a specific manipulation which is called rug pull. Um, because practically you invent a token and then you take it out <laughs> and you steal all the money. This is a simple, simple term. Um, but here the regulator have to understand the problem, not simply look as a technology uh, problem, 
but it's a structure and needed to be tackled in a different way with a more um, knowledgeable from the different perspective. I give another example of vulnerability with smart contract now. Now, smart contract has numerous operational vulnerability, really a lot. I will just stop on a small one. Now, if you look at decentralized apps, so the decentralized apps are the apps that allow uh, smart contract to function. And uh, um, you know the smart contract are very difficult, impossible sometimes to stop, to modify or to reverse. This contract, in order, because they have to cover so many possible states, uh, are very complex. And when we increase complexity in coding, we are, um, uh, there is a direct link with the possibility of errors. And when you have errors, you have also, again, vulnerability. And this vulnerability are exploited continuously by uh, creating different type of contracts, which are, we call greedy contracts, suicidal contracts, prodigal contracts, which again are fraud. And uh, again, you see manipulation of the market also in this case. And in this case, we have a technical aspect that cannot be solved very easily because error encoding is it's, uh, possible. Um, but it can be so it needs to be solved by the regulator as well. So technical has to be added uh, by the knowledge. So technical is not enough. So I will conclude now and then we can go after with another aspect. Uh, vulnerability. So I will uh, like to speak with all, all of you because you are expert in law. And so there are the people that will write a regulator. So when you hear vulnerability, be careful. What I wanted to say, because is a is a things that also cover your space and often cover the space. For example, my space as a financial expert, because there will be aspect important for the stability of the market. So it's not just hacking; it's not just a technical aspect. And one of the problem to solve this combination of technical and or the aspect of vulnerability is to have. Uh, for example, good quality of data. So at this moment, we have a very poor quality of data in relation to DeFi. Uh, we have also very poor compliance reporting and also uh, unclear framework of how governance is, is done. The other problem is the interconnection and the interconnection will be solved only when we think of regulation of crypto asset rules from an international point of view, so from an international perspective. So these are just my initial point. Uh, sorry, Luis, if I took too much time, <laughs> but okay. Not, I not, not at all. It was most, most interesting. You, you referred your condition as an economist and engineer. I recall that a good friend of mine spoke about competition law as a no man's land between lawyers and economists. <laughs> and I guess financial regulation can be a no man's land between lawyers, economists and engineers, but we, we are trying to bridge the gap here. And I think exactly successfully <laughs> with, with your, with your intervention and we'll have other, other points to cover in the, in the further rounds of, of discussion. I think that Matteo Gargantini is not still with us. He's still retained probably. I am, I am here actually. Yes. You are. Okay. Matteo then. We'll then follow the order of the program, which which is good. I was anticipating that you would be still retaining, retained at, at the other ceremony. By the way, congrats for the for the prize on, on, on the paper you, you co-authored. But then I would give you immediately the floor to you to, to cover the, the subtopic, the prevention of market abuse, the role of rec tech and sub tech. The floor is yours, Matteo. Thank you very much, Professor Moraes, and many apologies to all the other speakers for not being able to attend before. And actually, I have to say, I could listen to the final part of uh, Professor Medda's uh, presentation, and I think, well, there are many, many things uh, that we we can talk about uh, in the follow-up of this uh, conversation, which is great. I have to say, well, uh, I myself, I, I'm not very much of an IT uh, person. So I'm more on the side of law. So when I was uh, given this uh, topic on reg tech and sub tech, I immediately raised an eyebrow saying, okay, well, how do I tackle that kind of topics? I have a little bit more of an expertise in market abuse. I've been working for some, some years uh, on the field. So maybe uh, I, I uh, so what I decided to do is to have a look at some papers from uh, people that are working with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning 
the very few things I could get uh, as a layman and try to see a little bit, okay, what do they need from us? So uh, what, what can we do uh, as people involved in, uh, well, regulation or policy making uh, in a broad sense? What, what can we do to facilitate their, their uh, job? So, uh, in my uh, 10 minutes, perhaps even uh, even uh, less for my first uh, round, uh, I would like just to, to, to mention something briefly. So, first, the fact that after all, uh, after thinking a bit about the topic, I, I thought it immediately, well, perhaps, but actually, subtech and regtech are not entirely new, especially in the market abuse field. I mean, they've always been there ever since I can uh, remember. Uh, well, I'm not particularly old, but I'm not that young any any longer. Ever since I can remember, there has always been a, a, a financial content authority where I, I've been working some softwares trying to detect um, market abuse schemes and uh, try to see what kind of patterns uh, you could uh, identify on the market and to see whether those patterns could uh, reveal an underlying uh, manipulative uh, uh, scheme. Um, so, and uh, actually, this is perfectly reflected today in the uh, market abuse legal uh, framework. Uh, there you have, well, first, a, a lot of fintech when it comes to high frequency trading. Uh, so, uh, there is a lot about uh, uh, methodologies to develop and test uh, the algorithms. So, of course, they don't go into the methodology, but they uh, ask. Uh, firms that um, engage in uh, algorithmic uh, trading to actually have them. For instance, they uh, these firms are asked to avoid any black box dynamics. So they have to make sure that their uh, algorithms do not behave in an unintended uh, manner. Other remarkable things that I uh, thought it would be worth highlighting in the very introductory point of my speech is that, well, you have the requirement of having a, a testing environment, which is separate from the production environment. So if you have this black box dynamic, maybe you can spot it before you connect your algorithm to the to the market. That's also something which is pretty much in line with what the IT literature I could uh, have access to recommends. And also this idea of embedding uh, pre-trade limits into the algorithms. But when it comes to the uh, uh, to the uh, subtech more closely, well, uh, uh, of course there, there are uh, uh, there there is no way uh, but to have a, uh, an updated software for supervisors to spot uh, market abuse uh, schemes. Uh, and in this re regard, uh, they are supported by obligations, of course, from market participants. So you have the uh, the uh, uh, store reporting mechanism, so the reporting mechanism for the suspicious uh, transaction and order reporting, that's the uh, uh, perhaps one of the most important tools. And this requires, from a regtech point of view, that trading venues um, and also people that are, uh, as the law says, are professionally arranging or executing transactions, they must have automated system to spot suspicious tra transactions and to re report them. And I, I'm not even mentioning, but this is something Professor Med has mentioned already at the very uh, end of her presentation, while the uh, MIFIR and DEMIR reporting obligations, they are also uh, an essential tool, especially the MIFIR reporting ob ob obligation, they are an, an essential tool for supervisors to sp uh, spot. So. What can we do as regulators? Well, by having a, a look at the literature again, the uh, small part I could understand, essentially I noticed that the, the main concerns uh, revolve around uh, two most important elements. Uh, you, you can connect all of them around these two, at, at least in my opinion. So the, the first one is that there are some studies complaining that it's very difficult to have a clear definition of what market abuse is, especially market manipulation. That's an area where these people writing these papers uh, on uh, machine learning in the area uh, complained a lot about. And then the second point, and again, this uh, goes to Professor uh, Mendes, a point, the quality of the data they can rely upon. Uh, so what, what comes out of these uh, uh, things? Why are these things uh, challenging? Well, first, apparently there are, uh, there is a very small amount of market manipulation out there. Apparently, this is what the papers claim, or at least not in an amount that is sufficient to feed machine learning mechanisms. So what they have to do is to simulate on their own um, manipulative uh, uh, strategies so that the machine can learn. I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. If anybody from the IT uh, world is uh, connected, please just let, let, let me know. But the, the fear in this case is that you, you could have some feedback loop. I mean, how uh, maybe uh, you are just uh, uh, um, 
helping the machine to learn something that you have already in mind, but not really to spot something, something new. And in this regard, the, the second uh, problem that, uh, that is uh, very often mentioned is this sort of a cat and mouse system where the algorithms learn from each other. So the, um, uh, the algorithms of the traders can learn to, uh, to spot the, uh, the um, uh, schemes that the uh, supervisory algorithm can uh, actually uh, uh, detect and would uh, react consequently by adjusting the way it is uh, trading on the market. Apparently, the good news in this regard is that the more you try to uh, take into account these features, meaning the, the fact that you might be spotted if you perpetrate certain schemes, the less um, profitable is the manipulative uh, uh, action. So this is something that maybe is worth uh, mentioning. But most importantly, the one of the most uh, voiced complaints is that the definition of what market manipulation is is very difficult to uh, understand. Uh, this, of course, brings us lawyers perhaps back to the mind to the Fischel and Roth theory, whereby, well, actually, we shouldn't even prevent market manipulation because it's simply impossible to define precisely enough what market manipulation is. Maybe we don't need to 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 go that far, but the point remains that most of the market practices could be legal or illegal depending on the context and and actually i have learned that in the jargon of the it people you say that the uh, anomalies that you have to spot are always contextual and collective meaning you you're not able to say whether something is market manipulation or not if you don't put it into the context and that makes the whole thing very difficult but also you cannot tell it if you don't uh, check for the relationship between the entity that you are monitoring and other entities, maybe in other markets. So what is the problem here? It's very difficult to find a clear cut definition, of course. And as lawyers, we know that uh, general uh, rules are, uh, uh, so general principles are uh, important to have a sufficient level of flexibility, which is something that even the IT industry apparently understands because they are also afraid of a, of a dynamic which I learned uh, right a few days uh, ago, which is called the concept drift. So if you go for a too narrow a, a definition, then the, the risk is that, again, the algorithms uh, or the machine learning mechanism will learn out of that and they will find new ways to manipulate. So if you're too specific, that's not good. But if you're too generic, uh, that's also not good. So uh, here I have to say the question mark remains open, at least as far as I'm concerned. The second point, and I will close then because I'm already, I've been talking already too much, uh, is about not only the quality of the data, again, this is something Professor Mendes uh, Abdi pointed out, but it's also about how we organized our reporting system. So for instance, uh, consider what I told you about the fact that the market manipulation is always contextual and collective. Now, as an investment firm, uh, if you have to report on uh, on the uh, store, uh, but even as a trading venue, you will only have a limited picture. So you, unfortunately, you see only a part of the market, inevitably. And so who is going to see everything is the supervisor normally, because they are receiving uh, data from more than one, just one trading venues and more than just one firm. And this makes the soup tech uh, particularly relevant. But do we have as supervisors the financial resources that we hope with the uh, with the technological development on the uh, on the market? The second point that is mentioned is that uh, in the Mifir framework, uh, the transactions there is no reporting of orders. So orders are only available upon request to the national competent authorities. But unfortunately, uh, as, uh, for instance, Mary Fox and John uh, Rauterberg demonstrated, it's extremely difficult to manipulate the market just uh, by executing uh, orders. M most of the time you will send orders that are deceptive and then you will cancel that. Think about spoofing or layering. That's the, the most common way. But if you don't see the orders, then you cannot detect this kind of thing. So on the one hand, a very fragmented uh, view from the supervisors. And on the other hand, they don't see the orders. And, uh, they can only see them upon request. But if, if you send a request, it means that you already have a suspect, which is, of course, a vicious circle. How can you have that in the first place? So very final point uh, uh, that I would like to, to uh, make is, OK, these are the things maybe that maybe we should work uh, on, but the question that I was, I was wondering, and this is really what I leave perhaps to the discussion is, it looks like we have a sort of a chicken and egg problem here, because if we push harder on the technological requirements on the, on the market, meaning we just want more data and uh, for instance, uh, let's uh, also share the orders on a real time basis. Okay. 
The question is, what are the consequences of this? Is the market ready to digest uh, this huge requirement? So how should the regulatory requirements push for uh, uh, reg tech or, and, or how much should they instead take into account the uh, situation on the market? Also to avoid that maybe you impose some reg tech, reg -tech requirements that are uh, feasible for some largest uh, market participants, but not for the smallest ones. So though you actually trigger a, level, a, a higher level of market concentration, which is not good for the systemic risk. So uh, I th I, when I was reading about these things, I was wondering, okay, where is the equilibrium in this chicken and egg problem? Who comes first? Should the regulation more uh, reflect the level of the technology or should it push it a bit more? Maybe it's somewhere in between, but finding a, a the, the balance, I think, is one of the most challenging things for a policymaker in this re regard. Okay, thank you so much. I talked a lot, <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to give the floor back to you, Professor. Not, not at all, Matteo. Most interesting, I think that we will probably return to quote you exactly to your chicken and egg problem, probably with some interaction uh, with Francesco on this particular problem on, on regulatory requirements and, and to, to which extent we should expand those regulatory requirements. But now we will conclude the, the, the first round of interventions with Rolf Set uh, covering the topic of the role of financial literacy, which is uh, sometimes the, the, the elephant, the white elephant in the room I'm most curious yeah. about, is, about the, the topic. So I should say that in Portugal, the, the Council of Financial Supervisors, which is the body entrusted with the cooperation of financial supervisors, has recently concluded a review of um, financial literacy here in Portugal with some interesting conclusions. So I'm most curious and our audience most curious sh sh for sure about your points, Rolf. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Luis, for your introduction. I don't know whether you can see my slides. I have problems with my computer at the moment. Do you see them? Yes. Okay. We can see oh. it. We can Great. see it. So, uh, I will start with a short thesis. My thesis is that the more financial literacy you have, the less work is there for uh, supervisory authorities and for enforcement. So there's a strong connection between financial literacy on the one side and enforcement on the other side. And uh, in order to uh, show you the whole dimension, I would like to start with a provocative uh, question. Uh, is financial literacy a useless endeavor? We have a, a colleague in the US uh, who uh, wrote, consumers generally do not serve as their own doctors and lawyers, and for reasons of efficient division of labor alone, generally should not serve as their own financial experts. And uh, in my opinion, this argument is uh, not convincing because literacy here is confused with expert knowledge. And let's make a comparison. People need to know what a healthy diet is and where the nearest doctor is, but they don't need the knowledge of a surgeon. So uh, I think uh, we have to distinguish literacy and expert knowledge. If we uh, just leave the topic of financial market and look at uh, education in general, we have a very nice example from Germany where you can see that supervision helps sometimes, but education even helps better. Uh, we look at the statistics on the death by drowning in Germany between 1912 and today. And as you can see, uh, before 1912, uh, around 5,000 people per year died by drowning. And in 1913, the foundation of the German Life Saving Society happened, and they established lifeguards in swimming pools, lifeguards on the coast, lifeguards on dangerous sites on the rivers. And immediately, the number of deaths declined. And that helped uh, until the 1950s. And then politics discovered that it would be more helpful to educate people and to show them the dangers of uh, swimming in uh, remote areas and jump into rivers. And so they introduced an obligatory, mandatory uh, swimming lessons in primary schools. And you can see the immediate effect in the statistics. Uh, if you look at the numbers, we have now 299 deaths uh, by drowning in 2000. 2021. So you can see uh, education is a very effective means. 
And if we look at financial literacy, we can distinguish financial literacy on the one side and financial capability on the other side. Uh, financial literacy is usually divided into uh, three uh, subcategories. It's knowledge of financial issues. It's the ability to apply those uh, topics into a decision-making process concerning finance. And it's including the awareness of the ability of sources of information, intermediaries, et cetera. And the financial capability is then uh, and the next step. It means the ability to apply a financial literacy in a specific situation where you have to decide on financial issues. And we now have to uh, look at the uh, at a short diagnosis. So we have to find out where, we, where do we stand today? So uh, this is uh, a survey which has been uh, done by the OECD uh, among uh, what is the financial knowledge, uh, the financial attitudes and behavior in the G20 states. The maximum points you could reach was 21. And you can see France is at the top of the statistics with 14.9 and Saudi Arabia is at the bottom with 9.6. And the average is around the half 50% of the maximum points you could reach. So there's a lot of things to improve. Uh, and uh, it, especially if you look at the attitudes, uh, which uh, obviously cause a huge problem. Why do we uh, cover uh, why do we need financial literacy? Uh, first of all, we have to look at the individual level. Financial literacy helps individuals to improve their knowledge about making financial decisions. It helps to influence their attitude in dealing with those matters. And it helps them to develop skins and uh, confidence in making financial decisions. And uh, it helps them to gain more individual responsibility and more autonomy, which I think is very important in financial matters. If we look at the society, we have some effects which are more likely to happen. The first is uh, uh, population um, is generally wealthier and less over indebted uh, if you have more knowledge about financial matters, especially if you look at pension programs, pension provisions, the more knowledge you have about pensions, the less poverty in old age you will have. The likelihood of financial fraud declines if people are more careful because they have more knowledge, they are not as easy victims as they are today. And if you look at the knowledge uh, and, the in, uh, and the responsibility of uh, persons investing, you can say the less supervisory law is necessary because clients have more knowledge and therefore they don't need more, uh, they, they don't need less uh, supervision. So. The topic is very important and I think uh, it's even getting more important today because the number of necessary financial decisions in everyday life has grown during the last decade. The need to know about finance has increased and the, 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 the amount of knowledge required has grown because financial decisions today are more complex than 20 years ago. And therefore uh, we need more financial uh, literacy. I just let me make some examples. Uh, if you look at the pens pension schemes, we have uh, a lot of states uh, shifted from a mere state pension scheme to a dual pillar sc uh, scheme where you invest part of your pension into the capital market. Uh, if you look at interest rates, we have uh, had uh, unusual situations with interest rates during the last uh, 15 years and therefore uh, the need to know uh, in how to invest into the money market and the capital market has grown. Uh, the number of complex financial instruments has uh, increased and we have, as we heard today several times, we have very vague ESG criteria which complicate investment decisions. So the topic is uh, all over the place. So we now have to ask ourselves what could be a good therapy. And I think uh, we should start in schooling. Uh, basic skills of numeracy, of course, are very helpful if you are able to calculate interest rates. Uh, it's a good starting point for investors. But on top, we need knowledge on money management. We need knowledge on savings and investments and borrowing and debt. We need uh, specific knowledge on insurance and on retirement planning. 
And on top of that, I think today it's important to have a basic knowledge on consumer rights and investor rights because you have to know how to complain if something uh, goes wrong. And of course, you need access to information, which means you need the ability to search for information or to find an expert that can help you, especially investment advisors. So if if we uh, come back to the first uh, thesis I, I uh, invoked, financial literacy, I think, cannot guarantee good decisions, but it can improve the uh, way to have good decisions. There is because there is no cause effect relationship between literacy and decisions. But uh, we we have a higher possibility that better decisions will come out. So uh, literacy helps to get better decisions. And uh, of course, I know about the difficulty. What is a better decision? We, we could discuss about that topic for quite a while. And uh, we have, of, of course, we have the problem uh, that we uh, have uh, fast changing markets. If you establish a kind of uh, schooling program or tuition program, you have to adapt it very often because the markets change. I, I know about those difficulties. So uh, we have some we, well, we already have some uh, improvements in the past. For example, in my uh, view, the client categorization of MIFID 2 is a very helpful instrument because we divide people into different categories according to their knowledge. And the same applies uh, to the key investor documents which help lay persons uh, to distinguish risks, for example. Uh, and we have uh, product governance and product intervention. I'm not totally convinced that we have an ideal solution there. Uh, there are some problems in details which we could discuss later on. But my proposal would be we should uh, establish uh, an obligatory mandatory uh, topic in our schooling system, which is financial education. We need that. And uh, when we establish that, we should integrate the findings of behavioral finance. For example, the topic of overconfidence is a very uh, relevant topic in financial literacy, and we should uh, focus on that. Um, another topic would be uh, if we should prohibit inducements, for example. MIFID II uh, didn't prohibit inducements, but offered a twofold solution. Uh, you have independent advisors on the one hand side, and you have other advisors who are allowed to in, uh, accept inducements. And that still causes a lot of problems. And if we look at uh, the United Kingdom, they forbid uh, inducements totally uh, in uh, the relationships to retail clients in 2013, the retail distribution review. And since that time, they can uh, see that the financial decisions made have improved because people don't get those products who, uh, that contain more inducements, but they get products that contain more quality. And therefore, uh, the topic has an indi indirect effect on uh, the quality of investment decisions. We should start standardizing terminology. Uh, Edgar Löw uh, has pointed out uh, how difficult that is in the field of ESG. And we should, of course, look at the whole framework. For example, if you look at the German tax rules uh, on the financial market, uh, it's just not understandable. And uh, if you want to have financial literacy, uh, you have to uh, make those topics easier as well. I am strongly against a paternalistic approach as Willis, uh, I quoted her at the beginning, uh, uh, favors she, she is for more regulation, she is for more supervision and not uh, seeing that uh, there could be a kind of compromise between more literacy and uh, lesser regulation needed. Uh, if we look on the actual uh, landscape, we can see the Capital Market Union addressed the topic in action number seven. We have a joint uh, uh, paper of the EU and OECD on financial competence frameworks for adults, and they identified uh, 564 uh, topics that should be included in a financial literacy program. And if you look that through, it's very convincing. I think that's a very good approach. And uh, they will extend this approach to children and youth. So there is a, a project uh, in progress. And the same applies to the Yosco 
report on retail inter, uh, investor education that is on the way. So there are several initiatives uh, addressing the topic. Let me conclude with a, a quotation of John F. Kennedy. There's only one thing in the long run more expensive than education, no education. Thank you very much. Many thanks, many thanks, Rolf, and a great, a great quotation to to end this this first part of of your intervention. Ooh, and I thank you heartily for um, a comprehensive roadmap on on the development on how to foster financial literacy. We shall now initiate the the second round with uh, some questions and uh, discussion between all all the panelists. I, I would turn uh, first to to Marco, since I would try to as much as possible follow the same order of, of the program. And I would come back to Marco on his most simulating uh, presentation, particularly on proportionality uh, and um, apologizing for perhaps what is a, a million dollar question, but uh, challenged by the most interesting opinion of, of Advocate General Emilio, who, which Marco quoted. I would ask Marco if uh, in his view, considering the relevant developments on proportionality, we may be somehow on the threshold uh, of um, a new standard of review uh, in terms of monitoring the discretion of financial supervisors. Marco, please, could you elaborate a little bit further? Yeah, a million, a million dollar question, actually. Um, my, my perception is uh, actually that we are probably approaching uh, a new, um, how to say, a new consideration of the manifest error standard. So my impression is uh, so far uh, we consider that the manifest error standard applied it, uh, in many different fields by the Court of Justice uh, in light of our uh, past experiences uh, and perhaps uh, in light uh, of the case law, which actually uh, was settled in, a, in other areas. Uh, one is very illustrative uh, if you look at uh, the way sanctions, for instance, uh, sanctions uh, against the Russian citizens uh, are scrutinized uh, there, uh, the wide discretion which is granted to the council it has obviously political and social implications uh, and calls uh, for a manifest error assessment, uh, which uh, in turn calls uh, for a very, uh, let's say, visible self-restraint from, from the court, which is worrisome in, in some, to some extent also in that, in that domain. But uh, in, in, in our field, the impression is uh, and, and, this, and the same probably applies today also in the antitrust sector. The impression is that the manifest error standard followed by the court in the assessment of the technical discretion to use the taxonomy of Advocate General Emilio is, is different. It is not a, a, a review at a distance, but a very close uh, uh, scrutiny of all the relevant facts. And if you look also at the judgments of the Court of Justice on the Banco Popular case of the 1st of June, there the General Court was quite adamant on that also, on the relevance of the examination, very close the examination of the, all the relevant uh, factual elements, Leg legal uh, uh, substantive legality of a decision is very, very closely scrutinized. Uh, and in turn, uh, a statement of reasons, so procedural requirements uh, are evolving uh, um, in the sense that the um, actually standard, the demanding standard for the statement of reason, yeah, well, actually has been, uh, has, uh, uh, is becoming more, more, more demanding as I tried also to explain, then it is obviously a matter of debate whether the, um, this is right or not, but certainly this is also visible. So to try to answer to your question, I, um, I have the feeling that um, uh, the uh, general court 
has tried to, to, to show that at least in some areas, uh, uh, it could delegate, for instance, to Board of Appeals, uh, a role, uh, this, uh, this scrutiny, which is, uh, should be done more closely by affirming, by uh, finding that, for instance, Boards of Appeal, they should be called to the error and not manifest error standard. Uh, you know that uh, in the HR case, the BASF case, but also in the Akin case, uh, the General Court came to this conclusion. We had a few weeks ago, a few months ago, the uh, opinion of Advocate General Sanchez Bordona, which actually follows uh, the approach of the General Court. So in that sense, uh, there is a, a trend towards uh, uh, the delegation to the uh, internal review bodies of these uh, 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 er uh, uh, error uh, uh, assessment uh, on the assumption that uh, there are also technical experts uh, in the board, so, so they are, in a sense, uh, better equipped uh, than the general court to look uh, closely at uh, factual matters. But at the same time, if you look at the standard of review, which is uh, applied also under the traditional taxonomy marginal versus full review, uh, uh, I think we should appreciate that today uh, uh, also, the uh, manifest error uh, standard applied by the General Court uh, is very intrusive. Certainly, uh, uh, Advocate General Emilio uh, uh, warned uh, uh, the uh, Court of Justice uh, that the uh, steps, uh, uh, the very intrusive steps uh, taken by the uh, General Court in the Credilio case uh, were probably unwarranted. Uh, and in many parts of the opinion, uh, it is underlined that uh, the alternative view was not supported by the general court by sufficient evidence in turn. Uh, 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 so, and this calls also uh, opens the Pandora box also on whether the court should reopen the old practice of uh, apply or of, of appointing experts. But my just to conclude with the one one single word, my impression is. Uh, 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 it is a very complex issue, but uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, yes, there is a, a new understanding uh, on one hand of the manifest error test, uh, at least in this domain and in the antitrust sector. On the other hand, uh, there is probably a, a, a factual convergence on what the Board of Appeal, even if they judge under the standard of the error, and the general court uh, judging under the manifest uh, error standard as developed uh, can actually do so perhaps uh, we are to, we are describing uh, with different words uh, the same phenomenon and to make to, to keep things uh, simple i think that we can all agree that there should not be a de novo evaluation meaning that those who are granted the discretion should be the one who make the assessment unless uh, for instance in certain in certain agencies uh, obviously the board of review is in functional continuity which is not a, 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 the case in our context but uh, uh, beyond that context probably uh, uh, we should all agree that uh, the novel assessment is barred whereas uh, the factual and legal uh, evaluation uh, must be uh, very um, let's say uh, demanding. Uh, uh, um, it, obviously, there are. It is clear at the extremes of the spectrum. It, it becomes very difficult when you are confronted with several alternatives, which are not uh, black and white. So there is no simple question like one is implausible and the other one is plausible. When you are confronted uh, with different alternatives uh, which are all plausible, I think that at the end of the day, we should rely, still rely on what the supervisors did. And uh, on this, I think we, uh, we can also learn a lesson from Italy, because in Italy, we had our uh, uh, upper uh, uh, administrative tribunal that uh, in the antitrust sector at some point uh, used a, a different standard. So he considered all possible, let's say, plausible alternatives, uh, and then considered that uh, it was for the court, for the judge, uh, to uh, decide on whether there was one which was more uh, um, more reliable, so più attendibile, more reliable than the others. 
but this is also a, a, a trend that it is now reversed. So even uh, from the Italian perspective, uh, I think that uh, we have made a little bit of experimentation, but probably uh, uh, the middle ground uh, is the safer one. I hope I answer to your very difficult no. question. I don't know whether you, I can call you again a friend after such a question. No, no it's a it's, uh, most illuminating answer. Um, uh, and we are covering here for, I would say for both of us, uh, a sensitive territory you, you justly emphasized and i would recommend to the audience your remarkable paper i think co-authored with uh, david on the appeal panels and the comparison of, of appeal panels and you, you you rightly emphasize that the fact that the appeal panels have specialized skills may somehow influence the type of standard of review which is at stake and you also rightly emphasize um, the possibility of uh, the emergence of a more intrusive error test, although uh, without uh, overlapping the board of de novo evaluation. So thanks a lot, Marco. Uh, for, Louis, for if I only can uh, just add a, a, a word in response to Verle, because I found very interesting, uh, obviously, uh, um, presentation. Uh, I, I wanted simply to draw um, the attention of, of, of all of us uh, on how, let's say, the intersection between uh, guidelines and general clauses uh, are making, uh, at the end of the day, also these guidelines, even in the private law context, uh, at the end, binding. And uh, so this is uh, another, uh, let's say, uh, uh, testimony also, so to say, it is witnessing that uh, uh, luckily the court in the Federation Bancaire and, and in Balgaranska uh, came to the conclusion that the guidelines uh, can come under the scrutiny of the court. And again, Verle is uh, very right when she emphasizes the importance that uh, uh, even uh, private law courts uh, make use of the preliminary references much more. I'm, I'm again with David, we are also asking ourselves on whether we should perhaps uh, be a little bit even more imaginative uh, and, and try to, to build, uh, 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 not, not, not too imaginative, but uh, uh, to build a, 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 a judicial system which still relies obviously on national judges, but uh, builds a little bit more also on the experience of the hybrid the commercial courts and can all even envisage a European court of second uh, uh, instances so or an appeal court that could actually harmonize a little bit, but this is for the very, very uh, uh, next future. A very final point for Verle is uh, uh, the role of uh, Q&A and comfort letters, because uh, even, again, this interplay between supervisors uh, and private parties is very difficult because uh, uh, I remember we had also a couple of cases at the Board of Appeal where judging uh, uh, about the negligence or non-negligence or diligence of the party depended also on our finding on whether the parties were or not uh, uh, under the obligation to ask uh, uh, the opinion of the supervisor. So all these uh, issues are, in my view, very critical when we are talking about uh, enforcement in the reality of uh, the law of finance. Luis, we cannot hear you. Sorry, I have muted myself. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, I would give now the floor to, to Verla, asking her if she wants to react immediately to this last point of, of, of Marco, which was uh, a very relevant point. I would also emphasize, considering the last considerations of Marco and the relevance of guidelines, the interplay also between competition law, where we have an important body of law on the legal corollaries, uh, implications of, of guidelines and, and financial regulation. But I would give the floor to, to, to Ferla for some reaction on the last points of, of Marco. I would also venture, if my notes are correct, to ask to Ferla a point which raised somehow my curiosity. I think that you mentioned the relevance of some preparatory documents of MIFID that you wanted to highlight, but I think you didn't have time to highlight in your first presentation. If that is the case, I would invite you to do so in this in this second round of considerations. Ferl, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Luis, and also Marco for a very interesting question indeed. Um, 
how binding the guidelines become when interpreting these uh, general standards. Well, in my view, those guidelines, they are comply or explain, but they are comply or explain for the NCAs, for the national supervisors. And once those national supervisors say that they will comply, they become part of binding national law because the supervisors just say that they will interpret the rules in accordance with those guidelines. And so then market participants, the industry knows that that is the standard, because if they don't comply with the guidelines, they will not comply with the regulatory expectations of the supervisor. So I think in a public, from a public law perspective, they are binding and they are really the interpretation of the um, general standard. And um, as I said, as I believe that there is, there should be one standard, um, both whether there's publicly or privately enforced, I do believe indeed that it is binding in a private law uh, context as well. It would be very strange if you would interpret that same rule differently um, in a case of private enforcement. Um, so I, I don't know whether that answers your questions. And with Q&As, it's a bit more difficult, obviously, because there it is um, much more in doubt what the role is and what the binding force is of those Q&As. Um, if they, these are Q&As from ESMA, for instance, in this field, I don't think they are binding, but they have a highly authoritative force, I would say. Uh, and only if there's like a convincing reason why then in a private law and also in a public law enforcement, um, the, 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 the judge or the um, NCA can argue that this is not the right interpretation. I don't think it is necessary to always comply. So there I would say it's rather um, a stark guidance. Um, then on uh, Louis, on the question you said on the preparatory documents, um, let me check. It's um, it's just, I, I mentioned one, I think. Um, let me see what I where I have it here. Yes. It was actually in the preparation of MIFID 1 um, that the European Parliament proposed a number of amendments and then stating, justifying the amendments by making clear, and I'm quoting, that the new European framework supersedes traditional pre-existing civil liability. And so I found this very convincing that the European Parliament actually thought that indeed this is one standard which harmonizes everything. It harmonizes how an investment firm should behave. And that is um, both in the in the public and, and private spheres. Um, if I may add another point, which of I course, didn't touch upon course. yet, and uh, to make it even more complex, um, and that is what to do in case of international private law. Because there you have international private law where in a private law enforcement procedure, it is room one, or in a tort law procedure, room two, which will define what law applies. The difficulty is that a different distinction is made than in MIFID. MIFID makes a distinction between real and professional, whereas Rome 1 makes a distinction between consumers and non-consumers. And depending on that, a different law a, a different law will apply in case of a conflict between the investment firm and the um, client. If you look at a public enforcement point of view, there's still a different law applying you have the principle of home state control, which means the state of the investment firm, that law will be applicable um, unless there is a branch and then the host state will have uh, competences. So that makes it extremely complicated and I think it underscores uh, what I am I'm trying to say, that there is really a need for maximum harmonization and the, the same interpretation of the conduct of business rules, whether it is under um, private or public enforcement. Um, and then if I may, I would like to also still ask a question to Rolf um, in respect of inducements, because it's um, a topic which I have researched a lot. And there is this one element which puzzles me. If I understand you well, you would be in favor of a total ban on inducements based on what um, the results in the UK. Um, what I wonder is what the effect would be, because you say that um, 
the financial decisions which are made have improved, but I wonder whether the result is not that less investment decisions are made because the access to advice might be uh, hugely reduced if you need to pay for it because in, in my view, and I would like to hear what you think about it, maybe I'm wrong. If you have a ban on inducements, that means that there will no there will not be free advice anymore. And so when I'm explaining this topic to my students, I typically tell them that MIFID 2 tries to strike a balance here that um, instead of creating a total ban on inducements, they chose for a stricter regulation of inducements, um, even in the case of, um, well, non-independent advice, I think it's better to have some advice where still the suitability test applies and maybe, okay, the product you buy is a bit too expensive, but it will at least be a suitable product for that investor. And I wonder whether then the client is better off with that situation or a situation where there's no advice at all because it would be too expensive to pay for independent advice. Very good question. Ver. Let's keep it dynamic and I would invite uh, Rolf to address uh, immediately if he's willing this question. Yes. From Thank you very much. Uh, I would first draw uh, the attention onto the experience of uh, the UK. Um, uh, after introducing the uh, retail re distribution review, uh, around 40,000 investment advisors lost their jobs. So you're uh, right, uh, it is uh, strong, it, it had a strong impact on the industry uh, and a lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, the question is, is there an advisory gap or is it, uh, was it an over advisory uh, uh, before uh, introducing the new rules. Uh, and a lot of people say now small and medium clients uh, get what they really need, investment funds and not individual products. So then the, the kind of product has changed and people with less money, uh, which have problems to diversify are now uh, advised to buy uh, investment funds instead of shares or instead of individual bonds. And therefore, uh, their risk has reduced. So you don't have to look at the number of employees. You have to look at the outcome on the investor side. And that obviously has improved as the Financial Conduct Authority in Great Britain uh, has elaborated. That's the first uh, thing uh, that we have to discover or to discuss. The second point is behavioral finance. There, are, uh, uh, there is uh, um, a survey or, uh, uh, um, on the question, how do people react uh, if they know that the investment advisor uh, is allowed to accept inducements? And so they made an experiment and asked customers, how do you feel uh, after you heard that your investment advisor is allowed to accept inducements? And they say, oh, if he, if he, if he uh, explains such a heavy thing to me, I can trust him without any problems. So uh, care, they, they get careless because they know uh, the, guy gets, uh, the guy is honest and tells me he accepts such an uh, inducement from third parties and then I can trust him with, without any, any doubt. And on the second experiment, they asked the investment advisor how how he felt after uh, uh, explaining to the client that he's allowed to accept inducements. And he uh, got more scrupulous because he said, I, I uh, explained it to the customers so I can now take any inducement without any, uh, uh, any uh, care. And therefore, behavioral finance is a strong argument for a total ban of inducements because both sides react in another way as we would expect they do. The customer is less cautious and uh, the investment advisor uh, is uh, not obeying the duty of care anymore because he says, I explained it to the customer, so I can now act as I will. And therefore, I'm, as you uh, said, I'm, I'm for a total ban of inducements. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. I, I would take advantage of the fact that you have the floor to, to explore a little bit further before turning to Francesca and Matteo. Uh, the uh, point 
May I ask a question to? Of course, Mel? of course. Feel free yeah. to interact with the others. If if you say, if you say that uh, MIFID rules of conduct are maximum harmonization, is there any open space for the parties uh, to agree on stronger rules? Fell. So you mean that in a contract? Yes. An yes. investment firm and a client would agree on stronger rules. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Mifi, for example, says you have to report to the client every three months. Mm -hmm. uh, are they allowed to to uh, agree on every every month, for example? Yes, um, I'm I'm convinced they are in the sense that the maximum harmonization only uh, applies to the member states, and so the member states cannot um, adopt stricter rules, but there is still contractual freedom. So, I think if the minimum standard set by the rules is uh, applied parties can agree to um to adopt to stricter standards yes mm -hmm. i would say yes yeah thank you thanks thank you rolf uh I, I will come back to you if you have time i'm trying to keep my attention on the clock i think that we have about uh, 15 minutes but i would turn now to to francesca and and, and matteo uh, and and to francesca um well, running the risk of my uh, lack of expertise in, in technology, which has been emphasized by, by other speakers, but conferring my notes, uh, you have referred to vulnerabilities. I would perhaps speak about risks. You have referred of new risks uh, related with decentralized finance, such as operational risks, uh, which arise from the underlying technology and governance risks, which have uh, risen from the expansion of decentralized uh, finance. Uh, would you say that uh, the vulnerability to operational risks may be particularly problematic for users due to the irreversibility of transactions of the blockchain, if that is the case? Uh, I will say, as I say, that is a characteristic of the blockchain and the specific of the contract. Uh, of the smart contract, but uh, I think uh, what I was saying before, it was a question of uh, complexity, complexity mm -hmm. on coding, and so therefore of possible error that you have. Uh, that is not, um, I think the colleagues that talk about uh, literacy, that is one part uh, of uh, knowing <laughs> what are you doing. And so when the products becomes very complex, uh, uh, very also difficult to explain to, to to, to people and say, okay, this is the, is the, is the part. And in fact, uh, um, what I wanted to say now was about uh, um, narrative, uh, the narrative that we hear about DeFi and then the narrative created bias, by, sometimes by, by bias that regulators have, uh, and they, they say, ah, okay, we have done well, but in reality have created another problem. And, uh, so this is what's, what I wanted to add uh, now, uh, because we have talked about before vulnerability that you see sometimes only technical, but in reality is much bigger problem. Now, bias, possible bias. And the two bias that I want to, to consider are the narrative in DeFi. One is the environmental aspect, and the other is the inclusive aspect, uh -huh. inclusivity. So there are two narratives that you hear all the time in DeFi, blockchain, uh, yes, uh, environmental. Now, two dates, important, well, oh, important, interesting. So 15 September, 2022, as you know, this is the switch of Ethereum blockchain from proof of work to proof of stake. What does it mean for uh, people that are not expert? This was called the merge. It took several years for Ethereum to move, but practically now Ethereum consume as a reduction of energy consumption of 99.95%. So, okay, perfect. However, what happened in reality from the, from the from technical point of view? The proof of stake, uh, in order to verify, to create a block for the blockchain, is based on a lottery, a statistical lottery that who has more crypto assets has the greater possibility to be selected and to make a decision. Okay, so we are moving from a, a decentralized system to a very highly centralized. And by moving like this, we are moving towards not a very centralized of an authority that we are 
giving power to, but to centralize people that have uh, the majority of tokens. So few entities, that we, should, we don't know exactly the objective of these entities, that reduce the marginal cost of their, of their process. So he, me, if I have a few tokens, why do I have to participate? I go out and allow the decision to be taken by someone else. So we have been focused all the time on the environmental aspect. So, oh, ah, fantastic. Finally, it doesn't consume energy, but we have entered in another problem, which is quite big, which is the problem of a highly centralized system in the hands of very few of movement, transition there. So that is, I think it's a problem because uh, sometimes modification, technology modification produce also effect uh, in this case. Uh, on, uh, so you have to know the, the law and the regulation has to be modified. The other aspect that often in DeFi you hear is about inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, you don't have um, transaction cost because everything is peer to peer and perfect. Um, so uh, the 16th of September, 2022, the US Department of Treasury issued two reports in order to respond of uh, President Biden executive order on ensuring responsible development on digital assets. And one of the characteristics was, do digital assets produce a financial inclusion? And the reality is no. And, uh, <laughs> and not only is no, but um, is no, and we are far away to be yes. So there is a potential, and the potential is not near. Um, and this is important for us uh, the create uh, the legislation because uh, what we are listening to all the time is that there is a potential, enormous potential uh, DeFi use in credit space. And we are talking about particularly the consumer that are under bank and and bank. So two groups of people that for the legislator are very important. Uh, because they have to be protected, um, also the talking about uh, knowledge of finance and so on. But in this case, uh, uh, the present DeFi are built on uh, around the over collateralization of investor provided crypto pools. And therefore, uh, um, assume, they assume all the time that the crypto price will increase all the time. So the collateralization is based on this assumption, which we all perfectly is wrong because we see how it moves. And therefore this put a high level of risk for the people that take credits uh, in system up like this. So for this reason, at that point, uh, regulator has to have the knowledge, the perfect knowledge of what is going on and intervene in this case. It is, uh, I wanted to introduce this because we talk about vulnerability with uh, <laughs> something that very digital. And then I wanted to talk about something that we hear all the time on the news. It's like, oh, fantastic. It's uh, inclusive. It's uh, inclusive finance. Oh, it's very environmental friendly. But then uh, when we look inside, uh, we have a more pro sometimes it becomes more problematic. And they solve one problem by creating another. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for this very realistic uh, uh, and timely consideration. I would uh, now ask, because I think Matteo just interrupted a little bit his thoughts, uh, given the constraints of time, and to quote him, I would uh, ask him to come back to his chicken and egg problem. I mean, to what extent should we enhance the um, the regulatory requirements due to technology and would invite him to uh, discuss a little bit further these these points with with francesca uh, in these last minutes matteo well yes thank you so much for getting back to to that that point that really, that's a part that i had to cut a bit well honestly again it is, it is one of the many cases where i where i come to meetings with uh, questions well, but with, with no answers unfortunately there of course the point is how to calibrate the regulatory intervention based on the regulatory expectations i mean uh, on the one hand of course Regulation is a key tool to push uh, technological development, but it comes at a cost, not only direct cost, the, the indirect costs uh, are perhaps the most um, problematic ones. Uh, they're not that visible perhaps, but the, the, the fear that I have is that if you set to an ambitious uh, outcome, 
uh, for instance, asking for sharing uh, on a live stream uh, 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 way uh, data that at the moment are uh, only subject to a registration duty, then okay, of course, that comes uh, at a cost and the, the firms that can afford it might not be uh, all of them, so they might need to, well, some of them might need to, to merge because there are economies of scale uh, in these matters. Uh, some might even have to leave the market perhaps. Uh, for, so for sure you might get to a high level of concentration. And it's not just about market participants as we uh, mean them normally among us, meaning market participants from the uh, on the financial market, but it's also about market participants of the uh, software houses, meaning um, if uh, uh, this kind of exercise becomes particularly expensive, then you might re even reduce the uh, competition on that market. And again, let's not forget that the supervisors are normally not able to have their in-house proprietary software. So they would have to buy it uh, from the outside. Uh, and well, how about the conflict of interest? Uh, maybe that is, well, uh, this is something I've witnessed when I was working at the Financial Conduct Authority in Italy Consob. Um, so I cannot really say too much, but let's say that there might be cases where you uh, you open a public uh, pro procurement call for something and any, of course you have uh, for this kind of uh, uh, softwares and then of course some of the participants might even claim that I have a better product so much so that they are exactly those producing the software for the traders. So like, well, of course, nobody can know that better than we do. We are doing the same softwares also for the traders. Now, of course, that's, that's an issue from a, from a supervisory point of view and again, something we necessarily will have to cope with. Uh, again, the, uh, these are not new considerations that have been expressed already in the literature, but I think it's, uh, they are not solved yet. So maybe it's good to keep them in mind. Thank you very much, Matteo, for concluding that line of thought that you had pursued in your, in your first intervention. At this point, we are almost at the limit of our time. I would ask uh, each of the five panelists uh, at this time of the afternoon, if they have a final remark, I mean, a very succinct remark, or even if Christos or Filippo have some final question that they would like to address to all five panelists before some final considerations of my part to close the, to close the panel. We have the privilege to close the event so we can ask as many questions as we wish afterwards. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, then I would address only to the panelists for any final thoughts or considerations that you may have at this stage or any brief reaction that you may want to have on the, um, the, the other interventions of, of the other panelists. Matteo, please. Well, actually, I would like to just to confirm uh, I couldn't really agree more with what uh, Verle said actually on these uh, issues on the enforcement and this fact that uh, in the Petrucciova case, of course, we have this uh, clear differentiation between the MIFID with the investor and the consumers. And then, of course, when it comes to consumers under Rome 1 and 2 and Brussels 1, eh, also because it's a matter of where the judges, they might not. Uh, co co coincide and I have to say maybe uh, I don't know where we can uh, go but something I always thought it could be considered is to try to realign a little bit the jurisdiction uh, of the judge the civil and commercial claims with the competence of the national competent authorities where uh, I mean for instance the way dealing on own account is interpreted in the Netherlands uh, is completely different from the way it's interpreted in Italy uh, so that the exemption uh, from MIFID uh, applies in the Netherlands, uh, that's uh, that's uh, considered a, 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 an investment activity. In Italy, that's a service we don't care. So if you are a Dutch uh, provider selling uh, uh, financial, uh, selling um, uh, investment services to retail investors in, in Italy, you will have one interpretation from your home competent authority, which is the competent one if you are uh, operating on, on online. And the Italian judges will actually regularly tell you, no, we don't care. <laughs> so uh, just to support that point, which I think is really, really important for uh, even to have a, an actual capital markets union, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo, for the complimentary consideration, which was also most, most timely. I would uh, give now the, the floor to the, to the final conclusions to, to, to Filippo and to Christos. Just to wrap up and trying to close the circle with um, the initial keynote by, by Verena Ross, uh, ESMA has published uh, this last October the, the strategy for the next five years, which emphasizes 
Five points, fostering effective markets and financial stability, strengthening supervision, enhancing the protection of retail investors, enabling sustainable finance, as well as facilitating technological innovation and effective use of data. So we've tried as much as possible in the course of this last panel to address some of these topics. I hope we were successful within the limitations of time. I thank heartily all the panelists. Thank you very much. And I will give now the floor to my good friends and colleagues, Filippo and Christos. Thank you, Luis. It's, it's difficult to close a day like this. We had uh, a lot of outstanding presentations and discussions, and I must say that I run away, I go away with more doubts uh, than what I have at the beginning, because we knew actually that capital markets is fragmented, is multifaceted, it's like a kaleidoscope, uh, but uh, the picture that we had today shows that there are really strong deficiencies in the system that need to be addressed once and for all. And the capital markets union seems to me now, after all that I've heard today, like uh, trying to shoot with a uh, play with a game revolver to a huge pachyderm that's coming towards us. We have to sort of try and be brave and 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 and, and, and consider that this is this is a major task that we have to follow. And I was very much impressed by all the participants in the panel. Really, I say this not because you're my friends and colleagues, but I was really impressed. I was impressed with uh Fairly, obviously, she's touching upon, she touched upon a topic that is now right at the center of the attention of the academic board, because we are discussing this idea of having the EU charter for the protection of investors on a cross sectoral basis. And this is a, is a project that we just launched and it, it fits perfectly in the in what Fairly was saying. I was fascinated by Marco. We now have this constant engagement with the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice. He's much more, I mean, uh, proficient than I am in this area. But, you know, the, 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 the relationship between, uh, obviously, regulation enforcement and judicial precedent is, is strong. And it's a point of observation that we have to keep constantly under control. And then we had financial inclusion, which is a, a great topic. And then Matteo, that sort of was a sort of a, of a, of a follow-up uh, to my presentation this morning on artificial intelligence. And then uh, Francesca Medda, that I heartily thank, uh, she really gave us a sort of a completely new and fresh air in, uh, in our legal and regulatory debate that often forgets how important instead the technical aspects that underpin what we think we know are fundamental. So uh, thank you again. And really, I close as far as I'm concerned, but now I leave the word to Christos, this conference with more doubts than what I had at the beginning, but uh, a really challenging road ahead, a lot of food for thoughts. And, uh, and uh, thank you again to all of you. And thank you, Luis, for taking up the task of building such a great panel at the end of today's presentations. So, uh... I would duplicate uh, myself if I were to say that uh, I also have more doubts, but I have more doubts on another issue, uh, whether we are correctly called the uh, European Banking Institute or the, whether we should change the name to European Banking and Capital Markets Institute. Uh, because apparently uh, today's presentations, apart from uh, the fact that I was impressed myself as well, not only by the depth of knowledge, we knew that uh, we are all uh, working together, but but the level of present of preparation for this, yeah, I think that you have all spent time to prepare yourselves for this, and this is uh, evident. And thank you very much, all. Even in the panel discussion, I have seen slides. Yeah, this is unbelievable, and at the same time, excellent work uh, done by the uh, by the panel coordinators. Uh, right now, I can see uh, Luis, thank you so much, but all the others uh, before yourself. And uh, of course, I need to congratulate those 29 people who are still in the 
uh, in the room. Uh, Filippo, you give me the you gave me the nickname the Spartan, but I think that these are the Spartans here. Yeah, <laughs> these are the people who are in uh, in the system from nine o'clock uh, until now. And apparently, Matteo and Michele, a double thanks. It was your special day with this um, uh, honorary acknowledgements, and you took the time not only to speak but also to stay. And I think that M Michele is still here around, yeah, even though he's not speaking. This is this shows that ha ah, hi, congrats again. This shows that um, uh, we have managed to have a very very strong group. Uh, in uh, the EBI, thanks uh, to you. Now, it's time for my questions. No, <laughs> I will have no questions. I wanted to make two remarks. Uh, the one uh, to Rolf. Um, Rolf, uh, you are correctly pointing out that um, uh, early education is necessary, uh, meaning from the high school, yeah, not from the kindergarten, Partly, but again, <laughs> in this case, you need to educate the educators. Yeah. So this creates a second round problem. Yeah. Because you need to find the teachers who have sufficient knowledge. So you need to develop programs for uh, the, the teachers in the schools who will teach appropriately. Because if they were to teach what they know about the financial system, then the problem <laughs> would not be necessarily. Uh, resolved. It's kind of a joke, but again, it may not be a big joke, especially in some jurisdictions. And then, uh, jokingly again, Verle, uh, I know that we will meet in some weeks, so we will discuss it uh, privately, but I'm a professor of public law, yeah, and I want you to convince me fully how. Uh, is it possible that you have a rule established at European level, you are correct at European level, we don't have this distinction between your, uh, between private and public law. This rule is uh, giving an administrative authority the power to impose sanctions. If there is any dispute, it will be discussed uh, at the end of the day in administrative courts, and then you come and say and this, that this rule can be private law. Uh, you must be correct, but you have to persuade me on this uh, because I have to learn something that I'm missing. But again, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. And so we'll discuss that uh, further in uh, the coming weeks. So thank you all very much. Have a nice evening. I think it was one of the best uh, events that we had at the EBI. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the one that lasted for the most time, yeah? I don't think that we ever had a meeting which started at nine o'clock in the morning and is uh, finishing at uh, 5.30. So thank you very much again. And uh, Filippo, uh, most thanks to you, yeah? Uh, without you, would not have managed to do this. I know that um, I have also contributed a lot, but you were the chef d'orchestre and I was your right hand. So thank you very much. Uh, for having done all that and um, have a nice evening all of you have a nice evening, have a nice evening. thank you for thanks a lot bye bye thank you bye 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 b